year began over in the World Wrestling Federation. A new face-painted tag team called Demolition was uh, making their debut. The Hart Foundation were prepared to challenge the British Bulldogs for the tag titles. Andre the Giant was getting a little jealous of Hulk Hogan on Piper's Pit on weekly television. But over in Jim Crockett Promotions, our guest today was the current reigning NWA television champion. And uh, by mid-year, some shakeups in the Four Horsemen would have him tagging with Arn Anderson. And uh, that would result in even more championship gold. This edition of Timeline, the history of WCW, will be piloted or co-piloted by none other than a Four Horsemen member, Tully Blanchard. Thank you for agreeing to jump in the time machine. Sean, my pleasure. You remember the 80s? A lot of the talent say, oh, the 80s were a blur. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, I don't know. Some of it might be a blur. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>
uh, that they could probably use a little bit more of. Because we, every, every one of us had those things, whether it be Mr. Perfect coming in or, or Ted DiBiase uh, doing his thing or all the stuff they did with Hogan mm. and everyone else. Uh, it was a perfect way to not just see you wrestling, but see you doing something else other than wrestling. Mm -hmm. Does anyone go along with you guys to be the director for these vignettes, or is it pretty much up to you guys? What to no, they, had, uh, they would have... Uh, uh, usually the camera people, we had a cameraman, a sound guy, and, and somebody that did lights uh, if we needed lights. Uh, and uh, Probably the, it was the road agent in charge of the show that night or that day uh, that was in charge of, uh, of what we were doing. Your buddy, so there your was buddy a, Scarpa? No, he, he was, they never turned him loose doing those. God forbid. Can you imagine how many careers that guy would have ruined if he was in charge of doing these nice little uh, uh, vignettes on people out there? What's that all about? <laughs> One-eyed Jack, maybe? Uh, no, Jack wasn't good enough to do that kind of stuff. One-eyed Jack lens. <laughs> Hang on, I find him. How about Mr. Personality? How about Mr. Personality, maybe? Uh, he would do exactly what he was told to do, and he wouldn't stray from it. Uh, that's Mr. Personality. That's Tony Guerrero you're talking about, yeah. Tony would have done exactly what they had been instructed him to do, and it would have been done that way, and no deviation because he does he he's by the book. Did I hit the whole uh, road crew there? No, no, uh, Goulet. Uh, Sarge was good. He would have been good doing something like that. More than likely, it was whoever was in charge of the camera crew at that point in time was the the person that was doing all the directing because these road agents back then they were just old retired wrestlers who they didn't know anything about television product and these these things had to be usually we shot them with just one camera they were all one camera shoots handheld the only, yeah handheld. the only time we ever did or still camera the only time we did uh, multiple camera shots was when the Saturday night main events Do you realize you're going to get the full push at this point, or are you just unsure whether you're going to waffle in the mid-card level? Yes, just unsure. I, I, I knew that I had, if I ever had the opportunity, or I was ever given that particular spot where they would give me some kind of a spotlight, or some kind of a little push, I would be able to make it over that threshold of just pondering away at the first, second, third match on the card. And, mm -hmm. and, and these little things, these little vignettes, if they decided to do them on you, and then if you if you were able to do them and do them the right way and, and, and project yourself and de develop that character to get it across to the people, then they gave you more of those and you continually move up the ladder. So it was good for me that way. Uh, I didn't, at that point in time, and you're talking January, February, no, I never thought that we would uh, take this thing much further than just, if I, you know, I would always tell Jimmy, if I get a chance, Jimmy, uh, I'm going to make this work. But you weren't promised then? No, there was no promise, no. Okay. No, none at all. First, let's take the TV title. Uh, tell me what that meant to you. What was the television championship in Jim Crockett Promotions? Well, it was... When I first got there in 1984, uh, the TV champion was usually the first level of championship belt for somebody that they were, they were pushing. And I beat uh, uh, Mark Youngblood for the title, I think. I think it was Mark. Um, and then and, and the booker was Dory Jr. at that time. And later on that year, we, we made the TV championship something different at that time because we were wanting to elevate it but make it more uh, exciting. So I put a $10,000 deal on it. Right. That if you could be, and I and I lengthened the match instead of like a ten minute TV match or right. fifteen minute, it was twenty minutes, and and so by putting the twenty the the ten grand on it, if anybody could beat me, right in that in that time mm -hmm. limit, but the stipulation was if it went to a time limit, I won. Correct. Which was just kind of a. A chicken way to win matches. Right. 
you know. Was that your doing? Was that your yeah your creation? Okay. Yeah. And so it was, it, you know, I mean, we're, we're sitting there trying to come up because, I mean, that, that was kind of my natural, how do I say, uh, the, the kind of weaselly, arrogant heat. Gotcha. Okay. If, if you can't beat me, I win. <laughs> Heads okay. on wind tails, you lose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so... What that did was it changed it from the old TV title the way it was, is if they were pushing somebody, they won the TV title, and then you moved on to the U.S. championship or whatever the case might be. And it elevated that to, to a great degree. Well, once that was rolling, and then they changed bookers and brought Dusty in and, and, and kind of changed the regimes and all that kind of stuff, and then when I wrestled Dusty, when he first came in, and, and the new stuff wasn't exactly just changing attendance mm -hmm. like that. And uh, we, we sat down and, and had a discussion. And it, this was probably the only time that I ever really pushed myself, but Dusty asked me what I would do because I'd been a booker before. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is what I was taught. I said, whenever a territory's down, you put the best against the best. And you go after it. And he said, okay. And uh, I, said, I said, I know that Wahoo's probably bending your ear so that he can work with you. And I said, I said, what I would do is I'd put Flair and Wahoo against each other and have them beat the crap out of each other, and I can make you look really good. And that's how right. it started. Uh, <coughs> Barry Windham, what were your impressions of the angles, the angle that would develop between the Horseman and Barry Windham? Um, I remember some of the Barry. Barry was probably the most, or one of the most talented baby faces mm -hmm. in the business. I mean, there's nothing that Barry couldn't do. I mean, it was uh, it, it was a joy to to be in the ring with him. I mean, he knew how to sell. He knew how to come back um, and listened and great. Yeah. I mean, it was just. A, a phenomenal night. Great, and uh, and I don't remember just exactly the angles that we did with him, but I know there were there were a number You're of jumping them. him, and he would chase you guys. Yeah. First of all, what did you think of Crockett's acquisition of Central States? What did he think he could make of it that? He didn't. I, to be really honest with you, at, at that time they were buying up smaller promotions and they were just, that was the last effort before they all went under because cable television was growing so fast, um, 86, 87, I know we're talking about 87, but 87 was probably the tidal wave mm -hmm. of the growth of, of cable television. So the, the show from Atlanta was just burying right. all these smaller promotions. Talent, excitement, energy, national. We're on national television. And the the local, the smaller promotions didn't handle it right. And maybe Crockett didn't handle it right or Dusty didn't handle it right. But when, when I was at Southwest and we started working a little bit with Georgia Championship Wrestling, we, we brought in two of their stars. We brought in Baron Von Raschke and Tommy Rich into Texas to wrestle, not against each other, mm -hmm. but Raschke wrestled Wahoo and I wrestled Tommy Rich. 
So by doing that, and that was Wahoo and I had that discussion, and I said, look, if we bring their match in, it makes us look second rate. I said, if we come in and wrestle them, it elevates us to their level. Gotcha. What about Paul Period. Geigel? What, what did you think of Bob Geigel? Uh, I didn't, my dad knew him a lot better. I mean, I worked for, for Kansas City in 1984, the month of January, before I went to North Carolina in February. Okay. And it was very cold, and attendance wasn't very good, and... I went to Cal I went to North Carolina. <laughs> Good move. <laughs> what about Sam Houston? Sam Houston's a guy who seemed he could have been on the verge of a big push several times in his career. Never quite happened. I mean, in this case, he's, he gets sent to Central States and then he's gone from the territory. Well, I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't privy to a lot of that stuff. Didn't want to be, and you know, I mean, I was concerned with in 1987 horseman stuff and the growth. And uh, I think they had started talking about uh, Turner buying the company at that time and how that was going to play out and the money that Crockett was giving all these other people that we weren't getting. And, and we'll get to all that. Well, oh, that's in page 52. Okay. January. I'm sorry. January. <laughs>
maybe more nowadays they have backup plans than they did then, but uh, at that point in time they would probably have just said, you know, his back's injured and this and that, and who knows what would have happened. Gotcha. I, I say there's no backup plan because if I remember correctly, we were we wrestled the night before WrestleMania and came into town and <laughs> I, what would have happened if we hadn't made it that day? And, you know, we had three towns going and the only people that was uh, in Detroit and at the building was, uh, I think, were the people that were stagehands and the, the technical people were the yeah. rest that was on the road. The night before, wow. Yeah, I think That's so, awful. if I remember correctly. We were on the road. Do you remember this night when they were both I, in I, I do remember that, and uh, they also tried to get into Baltimore at the same time we were there at one point in time, and they ended up in, I think, because there wasn't an arena or something for Baltimore because Vince had it tied up. They ended up in Salisbury, or we were in Salisbury, and they were in Baltimore, but that was the one time they did try to go, mm -hmm. and they did go head-to-head -head with us, and they did draw a, a, a nice gate over there. What was the talk backstage? Not, there was a lot. We didn't, we didn't worry about that kind of stuff. We didn't care. Uh, we had our thing we were doing, and, and, and we were going to sell out no matter what, and they weren't, a, they weren't really a threat other than we were glad that they were doing good business because it gave us all an opportunity if something happened that we wasn't happy with, we could all pack up and leave. Yep. And because we didn't have any binding contract to keep us from going anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were on contract in the, in the old NWA, WCW at the time. I think, and but uh, not very many of our guys ever left and went to them. Most of their guys ended up leaving, coming with us. Yeah. Their television product just was not as strong. They weren't. They didn't have. They didn't have the toys. They didn't have the games. They didn't have the the personal appearance uh, uh, machine that Vince had built in, and and they weren't making this extra money. Then they were making a lot. They were making really good money. Get that. They were making good money. But they weren't household names. Mm. We had become cartoon characters. We had become real life cartoon characters no matter where we went. There was a couple of guys who, who was there that was recognized uh, did, at that point in time, but until they came over, like a, a Ravishing Rick Rude, until he came over to the WWF, he was just another guy that worked over there in, in the Crockett territory in the NWA. So was the uh, Powers of Pain, Warlord and Barbarian, when they came over, uh, gosh, who else? Some more guys. They just—it was a steady flow of guys that started to come over. Even Hendrick, uh, uh, Kurt. I mean, Most of the fellows who were in the WWF when I came there had also come over from the old NWA, North Carolina Crockett's. Snooker had been was there and a big star in the NWA and for Crockett, Sergeant Slaughter, Roddy Piper, uh, Ricky Steamboat, the, the Rene Goulet. The list went on and on, and these were all people who were major players on that side of of America at one time. Now, the night that you're both in Philly, do you know if anyone from the WWF office is sent over to to the building the Crockett? I don't. I, I, I don't know. I never heard anything about that or that anybody infiltrated any other okay. anybody else's building or <clears throat> any skullduggery going on or uh, you know. It's like I said, we were doing our thing. They had they had a private jet. Uh, Crockett's had a plane that, that they would get on a plane and fly back to wherever they lived in Charlotte that night. Uh, we were we were back to the hotel at midnight, one in the morning, up at six, and going to the next show. Remember the incident? Uh, yeah, we we got word of it right away because it was a big it was a big deal. Uh, she said that he had poked her or punched her or something, and 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 uh, he gets off the plane. They had the federal marshals waiting, and he gets arrested, and away he goes. And we thought Jim might be gone forever, but uh, I have to say this about Vince McMahon. He did take care of his his people. When when this happened, Jim had had got in touch with Vince. Vince got him out of the pokey that night or the next day, whenever he could get out. Vince put the money up to have it, uh, to supply his defense for him. 
Now, mind you, Vince is going to get the money back, and, and apparently when Vince started to take the money back, Jim wasn't happy about it, and uh, so there was some furniture that got broken at the TV tapings once one day. Why do you think uh, Lex chose Crockett over, like, uh, WWF at the time? Because Crockett was in the period of signing guaranteed money, and Vince wasn't. Right. What were your impressions when you saw Lex for the, for the uh, first time? <laughs> Same thing everybody else looked at. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nobody. There was nobody looked any better than him. Right. Now, he gets a super push right off the bat. When that happens, is there resentment from the locker room where a guy basically walks in and gets put on the big stage right away? No. No. It, at, at that period where I was, I mean, I don't know about other guys having resentment, but the the nucleus of what we were, the horsemen, in 87, it was as heels, and we had tremendous talent that drew money in other places. You know, you had the Midnight Express, and, and uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't remember everything anymore, but, but you know, heel-wise, there were tremendous people making money mm -hmm. in the, all the towns that we ran. And I don't know if any of them, you know, it was, it was when Luger became, came in and became part of the horsemen, it was because they hired him, they signed him to a, a contract, and it was our job to get him over as a heel, just like it was our job to keep all the baby faces over mm -hmm. when we wrestled them, right. no matter who it was. At this point, what is Howard's job in addition to announcing? Now, we know we've, he's gone on to assume a little more importance, Gosh. but at, the, at that time, was he just doing the, uh, the ring announcing? 1987? No, Howard was, uh, Howard was involved in all of the, what we call, radio taglines and radio interviews and scheduling us, scheduling us for hotel room interviews and because we might do those, we had three days of TV tapings, we didn't finish them, so we might be in Denver on a Thursday, and that Thursday we met in a hotel room, they have a, a nice hotel suite somewhere at, at the hotel near the building, and we would do interviews that day, and Howard was the one who would schedule us and tell us, give us a sheet of paper with our name on it and where they were scheduled and what time we would be there. And the radio taglines were the stuff where we would go cut radio commercials at the TV tapings. And he had a little voice recorder, and we would, you know, the, this is this is Honky Tonk Man. And I'm Jimmy Harden. We're at WMAQ 99.9 .9 in Chicago. And next week, come to see, we'd do these. And then at the end of that, we might have to do all these taglines that you hear on radio. And for the fans out there, when you listen to radio and you hear certain people who have come to town or they come into town, maybe it's a, you know, uh, my name's Toby Keith and you're listening to 101 Country FM and that's what we call a tagline. So what, what the star is doing is plugging the radio station who might be a sponsor gotcha. for the show, who might be giving away tickets. What award would you give Howard? Gosh, he was probably, he had, he, he, and he still is, he's the hardest working guy there because he had multiple jobs. He had to, and he never read cards. He never had a card in his hand where he would say, and now coming to the ring is so-and-so. Howard knew everything about everyone. He watched wrestling for hours and hours and hours from what I understand. He watched old tapes. He watched tapes from every wrestling territory that was maybe in competition with Vince at the time. 
he he was a finder of talent mm. because from what I understand that is how Jimmy Hart and Macho Man and Elizabeth was found by Howard Finkel who was watching some tapes on them out of the Memphis territory and that's how Jimmy Hart got the call and then they called Randy and Randy had just married Elizabeth and, and he said if you don't mind I'd like to bring my wife along because she'd be a valet and that's how that all evolved but Howard was instrumental in that. It, we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss the tour schedule. You mentioned before uh, a little bit, but it, here's a good example. Uh, we, we're talking about January 19th, 1987. Now, there's two other shows also going on that night. WWF, at their height, in their heyday, 87, they're running... A, no Gatorade bottle, by the no, way, no, today. No, we more, should point no more Gatorade. Out. No, 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 no more, more Gatorade, Gatorade huh? Uh, March 16th of 2008 was the last year. Drink a Gatorade. Stay away from the Gatorade, kids. No more Gatorade. Um, okay, so you're running an A show, a B show, and a C show. When I yeah. say you, I mean WWE. Right. At the time. The company. Um, so now, who's arranging the insane tour schedule? Uh, not tour schedule, but travel yeah, schedule. Yeah, there, there was no tour schedule at all uh, as far as the scheduling. It was like... But booking guys. Like, okay, Pat Patterson, Patterson and yeah. Vince. Really? Pat and Vince. They, were, they did all that. Wow. Um... Even arranging the arenas and all they that had stuff. Uh, a fellow there that did the the arena stuff who came along with Vince many many years before that a fellow named uh, Ed Cohen who's no longer with them but uh, Ed did the buildings when I was in Calgary I was in, in fact I was in Edmonton at the big get the and he was out that's how I met him he was out scouting buildings mm. and then uh, he went back and gave a good good word for me back at the office and pretty soon uh, my number came up and I got called but Ed was in, a little bit instrumental in that but he would go out and scout the buildings go back and tell Vince what the deal was and then they would rent the buildings so he was pretty much that part of that now on this particular date in question January 19th you worked a C show and you worked against Pedro Morales um, your thoughts on Pedro first of all I guess we should address uh, Pedro was way toward the end of his career and just was a bitter person. Mm. He did not want to cooperate with anyone. Him and Billy Jack Haynes almost came to fisticuffs before I arrived there when they were doing the old uh, Tuesday Night Titans television show, mm. which was like a Johnny Carson show. Uh, I remember Billy Jack telling me the story about Pedro coming over and Billy's laying on the, on the thing resting and he said, Billy... Billy, you're not gonna make it, Billy. And it just, it bothered him, so they almost came to fisticuffs over that. Billy, you're not gonna make it. Not gonna now, make who it was in, he in gonna, the business? Yeah, who was he to tell somebody he's not gonna make it? How are the, how are the sea shows different? We'll just leave it open. They're just like smaller that. venues. Mm -hmm. uh, smaller venues, the music's not done quite as loud, there's not as many... There's no not as many lights and the, the, the whole works you go with a twenty feet uh, thousand seat arena. You know you're talking about the uh, Catholic Youth Center over in Scranton, Pennsylvania. They have what two thousand fifteen hundred two thousand people. Just a glorified high school gym. And uh, your payday is going to be reflected paydays on that. Are, yeah, I mean it's, yeah. They, the, the guys might be in the garden making five thousand. You're over here making three hundred. So uh, there is a difference. Right. Uh, but the sea shows were a way to. Promote a person who who was starting, who was just coming in, who was going to get a position. It was a good way to test guys to see if they could take this grinding grind that we had a 300 days straight in a row. Mm -hmm. If they could do it for four or five or six months, if they pass that test, then you move on up to another show, or you go back and forth between the B show and the C show. Not too many of them of those people ever went over on the A shows because it was reserved for guys that they were really trying to draw money with. Right. Do you think Wyndham should have gotten a babyface title run at this time? Was he ready? Oh, I don't know. That was a different, there was, being the, the NWA champion was a different beast. Right. And how you got it, and I think the NWA was still 
a fragment, but it still was there and right. people had votes. And, and uh, so I, I don't know because I was never at that level. Right. I understand. So, yeah. A little um, political maybe a little bit. Right? Oh, it, it was very political. Mm. But it was, um, you know, Barry was, Barry was a tremendous, tremendous talent. And uh, the, th the thing about championships and, and the nature of championships, and I'll throw this in for whatever it's worth. You had two big companies. Each one had a different philosophy. The NWA had always thrived with heel champions because heels could go make the babyface stars. Okay, the underdogs always get people charged. New York, WWF at the time, WWE now, has always had babyface champions and bad guys get built up to get beat. Right. And so being a heel up there was not necessarily flattering. You had a six month tenure, then you were headed somewhere else. Exactly. And, and but, but you look at longevity through the history of the business, the, the champions that made more baby faces and would travel around and make baby faces. And at that time, as the smaller territories were going, as we made more baby faces stars, you still remember the baby face stars that worked for WCW. And you don't remember the heels at all. Right. But you remember Bruno. You remember Backlund. Right. Interesting. You know. Along the lines of the two philosophies, was the weekly TV show. You had Crockett's weekly TV show, which would feature occasionally main event matches, such as in this case, which took the entire show, Wyndham and Flair in the ring. It's a main event match. You could, you could sell that to an arena. Whereas WWF television was always squashes, wall-to-wall -wall squash matches, two minutes each, and that was it. Um, what's more effective? Well, I think a mixture. I think we had a lot of squashes, too. But... The thing that is important is the philosophy of the performer. And my philosophy, Flair's philosophy, Arn's philosophy, if you are out there and you just go out and squash a, a guy, if you have beat up a sack of potatoes, who have you beat? And so it was important to make your opponent look worthy enough yeah. to be beat. Sure. And that was the difference in the shows and 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 stuff. But I mean, it, but that was left up to us, right, uh, to a great degree. Brad was was so good in the ring that it was just an amazing thing. The you beat up Brad, and then you had to wrestle him and his dad. Right. <laughs> exactly. And and uh, it was it was very hard to get his dad off his feet. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Bob didn't exactly uh, fly with uh, no, 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 on his no, feet no, 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 from the no, body no. slam. No, no, it didn't. It that that, that wasn't happening. And uh, <laughs> but it was it was a great. There's nothing Brad couldn't do. Why he was not a great big star? I was going to ask you that. If you were going to go that, yeah. There are some, just some intangible things, that you. You can't really say this is what his problem was. You know, it might might have been the the ability on interviews to be convincing or to be that motivating to fans. Tim Horner, same thing. But I mean, in the ring, 
both of those guys unbelievable. Right. I mean, I've had countless matches and, and great matches and uh, TV title broadways in front of 14 people. And it's hard to have good matches then mm -hmm. when you have no, really no feedback at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday after you, you really don't want to be there. Um, you know, but it, it is, you know, that, that, those, those guys had talent just unbelievable. Okay. And, and just one of those things that he never it, broke through. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a political thing. Sometimes it's a, a Booker thing. Some, you know, and, and, uh, I mean, it's certainly not because we didn't sell for him and, and do what we needed to right. do. It, it just didn't boil the water. What did you think of the whole angle, anyway, with the old friends and the, how they did it on Piper's Pit? And the, Did you think it was handled well? It was done better than I thought it would. It, it actually turned out better than I thought it would because Andre was so over and so loved as this huge, bigger-than-life, baby-faced, good-guy character. And it, he actually pulled it off. He was able to do it. Uh, and to that, it's a testament to him. They gave him the, the setup to do it, but there again, if the person can't do it, the setup means nothing. It just proved, I suppose, that Hogan was able to get it over for to make Andre look like such a bad person now. Mm. And for Hogan to come off as the squeaky clean good guy in all this, when Andre had always been the biggest good guy around the world and uh, boy had people started hating him and it the heat for people hate it just grew and grew and grew I never dreamed of going to that building that that, that, that would be that many people there mm. I I mean we knew it was gonna be big but that big he had Bobby Heenan into the mix too who, uh, who was probably yeah. the manager with the most uh, of you know. yeah Bobby and Bobby of course uh, a great mouthpiece, a good talker, could get could get his guys over, could put them in a position for them to get over. Where Andre, of course, he would, his speaking wasn't as good as somebody like a Bobby. He could do it as a baby face, Andre could, but when it come to being that heel and say all those bad, dastardly things, that was for Bobby to do, and Bobby did well. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I wasn't in, we weren't on the same cards, but I knew that he, he had had a back injury or his back was bothering him. And, and it was to the point, I suppose, that they were having to help him get on and off the airplanes. And toward the end, he was, he couldn't even, he couldn't use his foot or something. Uh, they, he was having to strap and tape his foot up really tight and, and do all those things you have to do to make it through the matches. And it got to the point where he finally just had to go home. Mm -hmm. He just could not perform. But uh, I, and I don't remember how the back injury happened or where it was, but it was, it was one of those things. It's probably just compounded uh, injuries over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, he just, he drug along. I say drag along because he did. He was dragging along and made it through as much as he could. Um, in a bit of a controversial move, the WWF begins to, uh, actually continues to advertise the British Bulldogs as a tag team for all the venues that they were, uh, were booked in. Um, kind of a common practice for wrestling at the time if you've been selling the tickets. Yeah, but see, what you have to understand is the television was running three weeks ahead. So if a guy had been injured three weeks ago when he did all these interviews and did all these promos, at that, there's no way then to go back and pull these off the television because this was locally syndicated shows. And... Uh, it, it's a common practice. It still happens today. Uh, the Danny Davis angle, I thought, worked pretty good for Danny, who was not a wrestler. Mm. Uh, but he was able to take that bad referee type thing that hasn't been done very well since, hasn't been done too often since uh, either, and, and did it, he did it 
pretty dead gum good. I mean, gosh, he had brutal matches with old George Animal still. I can tell you mm. that. <laughs> George beat the hell out of that poor boy. <laughs> He supposedly was found by the international guy at the time, a fellow named Jim Troy, was setting up all the international operations and Sky Channel over in Europe, and uh, Jim was in charge of international, and somehow or another, Jim ended up finding him in Australia and telling Vince what a great guy and what a great talent he would be and this outback thing, he could do this, and then he comes over and we see this guy, and he's looks like he's never been in a gym before in his life and uh, he's wearing the outback jack outback stuff with the hat and he's got the vest on and the crocodile head on the back and uh -huh. he's got the the gum boots on and then and, and, and then of course he, he he was Australian with the attitude the Australian people and the English people just do not get along they never have, they never will. It's like the English and the French, they just are not gonna get along. And, uh, for some reason, he 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 rubbed the Amer Americans. They, we get along with everyone, don't we? We just like to divide and conquer, that's all. We want your oil. But he, he rubbed the American guys the wrong way. He came in with the you know, he was thought he was come. He came in like he was bigger than Hogan. He is the new WWF man. I, all right, what? He said, "I might, yeah, I might." Oh boy, man, he suffered. Not only did the did the British Bulldogs and and, and and those guys give him a rough time, but heck, just about everyone did. Yeah. Everyone gave that guy a rough time, and he was he wasn't that great in the ring. It was as if he hadn't been trained. So for you know, Jim Troy was never a wrestler. Jim Troy was a hockey player who, who played minor league hockey or something and ended up with Vince and uh, somehow or another, and Vince put him to work doing these things. And he, he, Jim Troy was not a talent scout by him. If that's, in fact, I think that was the only talent that Jim ever found. <laughs> I think Jim Troy, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, an old friend of Vince's and, yes, a former hockey player, who was uh, Vince's partner when Vince purchased the... Is it the Cape Cod College? I think it was Cape Cod Civic Center. Cape Cod they Civic were, Center, yeah, okay. Were, and then became a very trusted, uh, yeah, a business advisor yeah. to Vince for many, many years yeah. for some reason. And he he did very well, except for this Outback thing. I yeah. mean, Jim, Jim could not even come around the wrestlers anymore after that. But here's a question: So you've got a talent like this who comes in, okay? Forget about the boys. Let's say you're the office. It becomes apparent at a certain point you've invested a lot of time. <laughs> and some money in somebody, and it's just, they're never going to get over. What do you do? Gosh, what do you do? You've got eight weeks of vignettes shot in the can already. You've promoted them on the TV that's already aired. You've got them booked for the next three months in every city in the country. What the hell do you do when you realize, oh, we forgot to find out if this guy could work? Well, I, I would suppose the best thing to do is uh, to try to get your money back, and they always do this. I mean, I know Vince does it. I've seen him do it before. To, to at least get your money back, Go ahead and run with the guy for a few times around the horn, and then get the get him in a position where he can make someone else look good. You know, he can put uh, uh, another guy over really strong, and then more strong, and then pretty soon he's put the guys over so much that uh, uh, he really is worthless. Now this is a gimmick to sell tickets, or is he really getting out of the business? He was leaving to do these movie things, I think. So, uh, you know, what other way to say that you're going to take some time off is to say, well, I'm just going to retire. It's my retirement match, and you know, go around the horn with it and try to sell some tickets, and I'll still be the main event, and I can go out on top. And knowing all the time he would be back in a year, mm -hmm. and this movie's flopped, and. Right. Now, Piper's given uh, Adrian Adonis to work with for the retirement yeah. match, and Adrian is, at, by this point, been given a uh, borderline uh, cross-dresser gimmick with uh, bad makeup and really stupid Christmas bows in his hair. They could have done a better job for him. But he manages to get it over, and I guess it's a testament to him. What, what were your thoughts on Adrian? Adrian was, uh, there, the, well, you said it, he did get it over. He did very, he, he did wonderful with it, and, and could have carried on with it, but he had... Uh, 
Uh, he had his problems outside the arenas mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of was a, 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 what do you call it, a monkey on his back, so to speak. It was a gorilla. Uh, from a right gorilla uh, in some cases. And, but he, did, he was a tremendous performer in the ring and a good talker. I mean, forgot it. He ended up gaining so much weight, getting mm -hmm. so heavy, uh, but still was a fantastic worker. And, and him and Piper, the, the angle worked very well. What I would watch, I would see him do this thing. He had the uh, Adrian Jones flower shop. Uh, where he would had had this it was like a Piper's Pit was called a flower shop, and they had every time the set was done with the most beautiful live flowers. It's like I just wish I had the flower money. Right. So they were all real flowers. Yes, yeah. they wow. was. Yeah, the florist brought them in by the truckload. It was. I don't know what Vince had in his mind to do that. I mean, he Vince sometimes can waste a lot of money. I thought you know wow. maybe a couple. A couple of fake plants or something would have worked just as good, but uh, you know, on Jesse's body shop, they just had some wherever they could grab a set of weights and put in there. And if they didn't have weights, they didn't even they just have a bench somewhere. It looked like you were in a body in a gym. And uh, what was Morocco had Morocco then went and did the body shop, same same setup. And, but then when Adrian did Piper's Pit was a nice, not a bad set. Jake's Snake Pit was a neat little yeah. set, but nothing as elaborate as what they were doing with Adrian with these flowers. I mean, if you go back and you look at it, they were all real fresh cut flowers. Wow. That was brought in in the big boxes from the florist, and the florist people set it all up. Yeah. Wow. I just wish I had the flower money. Barry was a good guy. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, we, th there wasn't really anybody that was, you know, not that you didn't hang out with and whatever, you know, I mean, I didn't, uh, because of the nature of the, the horsemen, but I mean, you know, we traveled with, with some other guys and went to dinner with other guys on mm -hmm. the road and, and stuff like that. Um, I was never one to just really just hang out with the guys. I mean, that, that's just not where I was. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, don't know why. I mean, I, there's not really a reason or a philosophy or whatever I did, but it, it was, I, you know, usually traveled before I was a horseman. You know, I traveled with Baby Doll or I traveled by myself or maybe one other guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just but specific to Barry, when he goes up there and forms demolition, do um, you recall a perception by either Animal Hawk or anyone in the company that they were Road Warrior ripoffs? Well, sure, that's what they were doing. I mean, w w was was Joe or, or, or Mike vocal about? Oh, I don't yeah. think so. No, I'm again. I'm the vocality of those guys would have. We always dressed in separate dressing rooms. We always were at opposite ends of buildings. The only time we maybe saw guys were at interviews on Wednesday or at TV. Right. Dressing in on, on desks and cubicles in uh, TBS Saturday, studios yeah. on Saturday morning. And nobody wanted to talk to anybody then. <laughs> guitar shot that still reverberates 22 years later um, and we'll get to why. <laughs> Let's start with this being the first huge feud of, uh, of your run here with uh, WWE. Are you happy to be paired with Jake at this point? Uh, yes, because Jake was a uh, Jake was an upper card guy, main event player at that point in time. He was, he was in between being semi-main event, main event, he'd had a run with Hogan. Jake was a bad guy. Jake was a heel at that point in time. Jake had had matches, I'm thinking, uh, gosh, with just about everyone up and down the card. He'd either be the main event in one of the towns or the semi-main event, or he was always featured. Jake was always near the top. And then he, he was given this snake pit thing for him to go out and, and do his stuff. So, yeah, it was a, a great opportunity for me. I, I knew that, that this was the opportunity I needed. Mm -hmm. And just to be part of the WrestleMania and have a feature match. So that was important to me. Now, I, I, I figured Jake was going to 
uh, dispose of me and I would be back scratching and clawing with, with the likes of SD and then Pedro Morales and Tony Guerrilla and uh, Sergeant Rene Goulet and uh, you know the list Where goes on. Where does the sergeant on. come from with Rene? I don't know. Oh, it was a uh, not a. It, were they stormtroopers? The French, the French, the French guys that. Uh, I don't know. They were the okay. French, the French Revolution. It's a historical were, reference. That's yeah, funny. yeah. Okay. Over in the, like when that. they were invading India and places like that, and the, the French Revolution people. So who gives you the God damn it, God damn it. He was so good. I love him. <laughs> who gives you the. Uh, uh, Inside the office with Rene Goulet, available at uh, kpipcomtairs.com. Oh, is that, you have that one out? Yeah. That's great. I'll have to, i got to get Explore the, the life of the road agent with him. I've got to hear that because um, he was good. I gave him some shit. You <laughs> gave everyone some shit, huh? <laughs> um, who comes to you with the angle and how it's going to go down? Uh, is it Vince himself or... Vince was instrumental in it, and Pat worked out the fine-tuning uh, at, at that point, and then it was passed down. Uh, it was Vince and Pat at that point. The, the agents only took, took over on it when we were on the road with it. That's, that's when they would come in. As far as the television and what we did with the snake pit, Vince was involved in that. Is there any added pressure now because this is now going to have to carry to WrestleMania, and it's, they're setting the stage for this to be the biggest WrestleMania ever. Are you told, in not so many words now, Honky, just don't blow this one. This is the big shot. I mean, no, nobody ever seen that. We were just free to go and run and do what we needed to do. And there was uh, because no one had really at that point uh, blown anything, right. other than Jimmy Snuka had, had 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 stopped showing up, and Jimmy they had been cut loose, and Sergeant Slaughter, and then uh, Vince had a big blow off, a, a blow up, and and a blow off over the uh, something Slaughter was doing with the GI Joe stuff. So he was he was gone. So there, and, and of course, Strongbow was not, he was an agent, he wasn't working anymore in Korea, and all these old guard now, by this WrestleMania, mm. they weren't involved anymore. So they're, you know, we, we saw the opportunity for us to, to just come on, let's go do this thing. We had, there was, we were all going to play ball. Didn't matter. Now the guitar. Was it gimmicked? Extremely. Now it was a heavy, heavy ass guitar. Uh, they, the original one, I still have at home now, and I've said this before. It was a black plastic ovation, and an ovation is—I don't know if you can see this table, but uh, it's as big around as this table and about yay thick. And they brought that. It was about six or eight hundred dollar guitar to use. I, said, I can't use this. So they went back and they got another one, which was a heavy Fender type, really heavy. But it was a had a and people send the music business and guitars. I'll know it was a fiberglass covered, coated and varnished and everything, and it, just the fiberglass part. It was all it was heavy, but it was really really gimmick. Uh, now I know you're going to ask me, is that what sent Jake to rehab? No, it did not. I've said it before. The dust that came out of Jake's nose, I mean his ears, <laughs> was not something that sent him to rehab from that guitar, I can tell you. Uh, so I mean, guitar, if you want to use an let's, excuse, let's, let's a great back. excuse before I mean, we get to G. Yeah, but I don't care. Change. I mean, this thing, is, it's, it bothers me because people think that be, Jake, because Jake says it, it's, it's fucking true. Just because well, Jake says it doesn't mean it's true. Hunk, I'll go as far as to tell you that Jake has said, and it's, this is on his, DV, his WWE DVD release, that this guitar shot, courtesy of you, was one of the reasons, because of dealing with the pain, for his drug addiction. He, yeah, but he wasn't taking painkillers. That's true. <laughs> but, it, but it, of course, leads to cocaine. I mean, I... I've tried that, but it didn't kill any pain. It kept me up for three or four days. <laughs> I'll give Jake a chance to rebut that. I mean, because Jake and I are friends. We have been for years. Okay. Yeah. So it's all So, good. yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all good. Yeah. All right. He's, but, he'll say stuff about me. We're all happy. But it was a gimmick I wish guitar. he was sitting here. You're right. on record. It was a gimmick guitar. Yeah. Okay. Now, was it stiff? Maybe. Probably. Could have been. I mean, uh, it was a big, heavy guitar, but I... I just I don't think it, it it injured him as severely as you know 
Sometimes in our business we want to over, not just exaggerate, maybe over exaggerate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I think I mentioned before on one of our other interviews that, that people can get uh, if they haven't already ordered them up, that Foley put it in his book because he went and asked Jake. And I called Foley out on it, Mick Foley, and I said, well, I would appreciate if you would have checked all your sources, you know, maybe why didn't you ask me and get my side of the story? Why did you believe what Jake said? Uh, so anyway. Gotcha. That's a whole other story. But it, 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 was, it worked out good. It was good. Jake wrestled for another year before he went into had any kind of surgery. Now, he only wrestled for like two weeks after WrestleMania before he went to rehab. But what did also happen, though, you had to now get a bunch of replacement matches. Yeah. Uh, or, or matches with replacement talent. Yeah. Where Jake they, kept, they kept promoing been... Jake all the way through because, the, the, there again, the interviews have been done already preset, so then now Jake's gone, so here comes the, the, the substitutes who might have been Bruno at the Garden and Bruno in Pittsburgh and Bruno in Philadelphia and Bruno in Boston and I go out to Milwaukee and it was the Crusher and Denver was the crusher, and I go somewhere else. It might have been anyone who was on the card, maybe some C-team guy who they would now bring off the C-team and throw him in with me uh, as a substitute. And, of course, substitute has, to, substitute go has to win because he's a substitute. And to make the people happy, they thought, well, we got to let him. It's a non-title match now, or it's, it's this, so let's let him win. And... Uh, it was hard. It was dip that part of getting through that was difficult. But I knew that by the time Jake did come back, then we would be back rolling again, and we were. Mm -hmm. But he did go into rehab again. That I guess again. Yeah. So son of a gun. Yeah, and I didn't give him a second guitar shot. Now I understand if 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 I, if the first one sent him into one rehab, what the hell sent him into the second one? Did you did you partake in these, the bunkhouse? Uh... Mm, I, I don't think I was in any of those that that I remember. Uh, I might have had to. I, I'm not sure. I might have had to be outside, but I wasn't involved as being inside the ring for one of those. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't think I was involved in any of those. Now you might you might know. Well, you know who was Lanny Poffin. I believe he wore a suit of armor. For these. I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. Who was the, the nuttier of the two brothers? Uh, the nuts are spread around pretty equal there. <laughs> Actually, Lanny's a great guy and, and a great performer. And to go out and wear the armored suit was uh, a, a neat little twist. I knew Jim from the San Antonio Territory where Tully Blanchard, Daddy had the territory. Tully was... <clears throat> It was Tully. Yes, right. Nah, we didn't do anything wrong, did we? We were all saints. Went to church on Sunday. Come on. Well, he says found God, though, hasn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. yes that's, maybe that's good. That's good. I, I'm glad he has. Uh, yeah, I'm glad of that. Jim, uh, I, I met Jim at the, the, there, and I wrestled Jim a few times there. Uh, in San Antonio, he was doing he was doing the hacksaw Jim Duggan thing, not with the two by four, but still doing the same stuff that he does today. Same matches, kind of the stuff, and the same finish, the the running tackle, whatever he calls it, the thing. And uh, very talented to be a big guy, very talented. Was there a fear that putting a fifth, like, an associate, like, why mess with, like, did the Beatles need a fifth associate? Like, why? Clearly wasn't your call. Not my call. How'd you feel about it? Was it an intrusion on your chemistry? No. Okay. No. We were where we were. Nobody was going to invade that because of talent that that's where the whole deal was you know it it didn't make any difference who we wrestled 
who was with us, whatever. Now, Bob's 47 at the time. Um, is that too old to come in and be added to the mix for the identity your company has at the time? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, we got some, I, I just saw on, on uh, YouTube, somebody sent me a match in one of the Crockett Cups where Luger and I were partners. I want to say it was in Baltimore. Is that right? Okay. And uh, we wrestled Brad and his dad. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had to sit there and I'm watching my little iPad thing and, and I started laughing because I couldn't get Bob off his feet. <laughs> That had nothing to do with age, I don't think. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, Bob looked great. Okay. <laughs> great big arms and little skinny waist, and, and <laughs> you just couldn't get him down. And I just laughed. I was. I just sat there and laughed at about midnight in my bed. <laughs> all right, we all have to go find the match now. This is something for you guys all to get on your devices. And do. <laughs> Did he have a good relationship with Brad, le legit, uh, off, oh, off camera? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, yeah. Okay. You know. You talk about intensity and, and, I mean, 1985, he beat me up every night and twice on Sunday. And, uh. You know, and they weren't, they weren't just semi-beat-ups. <laughs> well, we talked to him about those on this very show. <laughs> he remembers his time fondly with you. <laughs> and uh, I've been belly-to-belly -to -belly suplexed on many floors and stages. And, uh, you know, but th th that angle and everything going up to the I Quit match and was so intense and so powerful that, you know, it was uh, uh, the night that, that uh, I don't know if he talked about this, but we were doing TV in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And he jumped in the ring. No, I was wrestling him. And, and it was probably, it was probably before the I Quit match at, at okay. Star K. Right. So this would have been sometime uh, in the summer. But the, the ring in, and I'd got this brilliant idea that I was going to do uh, the Sergeant Slaughter thing. And, and go to suplex him like I was going to suplex him outside onto the floor and then just drop him. I was going to jump off the ring and drop him on the top rope. And, and so I, the ring in Columbia was built a little different and the ropes were a little higher. So I wasn't tall enough to really reach over and get like I normally would. Right. So when I, when I took him up to suplex him, I had to lean back a little bit more to get him up. And so when I jump off the ring to drop him on his midsection on the top rope, right. I missed his midsection and hit the top of his leg. Right. And he went over. And so I basically slingshot suplexed him onto the floor. And... Uh, I mean, I, I, I reached out and I grabbed his, his head so he wouldn't land head, head first. And, uh, and so he landed flat and I looked at him and I said, you okay? And, I, and I, he, he couldn't move and he's looking at me. And, you know, I mean, we're killing each other every night, so what are you going to do? You know, I can't go, oh, gosh, yeah, you know, sure. I got to see if he's hurt, you know. You gotta go so, put the boots so, to him. So I got on top of him and started. I'm, I'm hitting him. Are you okay? <laughs> and that may be too much information for some people to believe, but anyway, the baby face is all poured out and.
to see if he was dead or not. And uh, uh, and he he got up. I mean, later on, I mean, went. I mean, it was two or three days. He was real sore. Mm -hmm. Nothing was broken, but some stuff out. And then we picked up the the pace. But I mean, that's the kind of guy that he was. And and uh, you know, then when he came back after. Uh, and I don't know what show it was, if it was his first show or his second show, but I went out and beat up, beat him up then. I don't, you guys are the historians on this stuff. Where would Magnum have been had the accident never happened, you think, five years out, ten years out? Oh, he'd have been, uh, uh, I don't know that he'd have been, I don't know that he would have been a bigger star because of the, as we talked earlier, he'd have won the world championship, but if he would have been the champion, you know, like Dusty won the championship for a week. Right. And on down for baby faces, you know, he would have never been the Ric Flair replacement. Right, right. Because he was a baby face. Right. Almost like a handicap in, in, in some ways. Well, it, yeah. yeah. And... But, you know, there were Ronnie Garvin won it for a short period and we'll, all, co we'll cover that too. All the rest of all the rest of the baby faces that won the championship, you know, he definitely would have done that and had it on his resume. And uh, you know, but he'd have been a, a, a superstar just long lot longer than he was already. Now his, his brother's already working in the company. Do, do you get any preferential treatment if your brother's animal and you come in? I don't in? think so. No. Um, what did you think of him uh, as he was starting out there? Do you think he's a guy who would get pushed? or? I didn't think. I mean, it was trying, you know, whether we worked with the, the newest, youngest, to the oldest, I mean, my thought was if I went out and I was supposed to beat somebody, make them look the best, Mm -hmm. that I can make them look without making myself look silly before I win or teach them something and, and go on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my goal when I went out, and I didn't have anything. I didn't deviate. Gotcha. You know, I didn't get caught up, didn't want to get caught up in the politics, didn't get caught up in the politics, and... Seems like a good philosophy. Stayed out of all the gaga, who said... This said, you know, I had enough guys reporting back to us that were that lived all that stuff. And then when in doubt, you just read the Dave Meltzer. Dirt sheets, and it was that. And then you got caught up on all the stuff. First of all, what do you think of Dick Murdoch as a baby face? He was a much better heel. Yeah. Through a great punch. Um, what about this angle and then finally, uh, they eventually turn him heel and then put him with the Russians. Good use of? I mean, we, we, needed, we needed more. Um, the territory was so big mm -hmm. and running multiple towns a night. I mean, you needed other people to be over to make that happen. You needed the Midnight Express, mm -hmm. and so that they could go do their thing, and you needed that kind of stuff, and, and that just made everybody's job easier mm -hmm. because you knew that when you went back to that town that you weren't in, it would be, it wouldn't be dead. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you'd never miss a, a lick, and that was, I think, the thing that everybody unthinkingly or unknowingly or, or really untalked about, we all relied on. I mean, if I was in Greenville, me and Arn and, and Rick were in Greenville, South Carolina, and these other guys were in Fayetteville, and then the next time we switched, mm -hmm. Fayetteville was still going, right. and Greenville was still going. You want every city to be hot when you get there. Exactly, so, yeah, sure. and and you don't want it to go down when half your, half your company shows up and you know, I mean, that, that was, right. th there wasn't, I, I don't think there was any jealousy amongst us. We were all getting paid well, 
and it was great. You have a favorite Dick Murdoch story? Um, He's somebody that you sometimes hear got into some shenanigans. <laughs> Maybe. Might be someone you hear gets into shenanigans. Maybe had some interesting personal beliefs. Um, Not as politically incorrect as maybe one might be Probably, today. yeah. You know, it depends on if he had one beer or if he had 12 beers. You know, his, his position might change just a little bit. But uh, it was, I, when I was in college, he was in Amarillo a lot. And then he worked for my dad uh, down with Southwest for a while and then came out here uh, after I'd already gotten here. And, uh, you know, I like Dick. I still don't know if he ever played football at West Texas, but, but I know he came to a lot of games when I was playing. So. Okay. <laughs>
I think you agree with me. I think you're being, I think you're being a gentleman. When was Tully Blanchard ever a gentleman? Oh, for about the last 25 years. Okay. <laughs> he eliminates Bubba. Now, Bubba's been booked very strong to this point. Uh, rarely, maybe not even losing or even selling much on TV. Was it exclusively to be able to put Dusty over at the bunkhouse stampede? He wouldn't do something like that, would he? <laughs> You've got the raised eyebrow. You should look at the camera when you raise that eyebrow. <laughs> trying, to wind them up. <laughs> trying to wind them up. I can't find the buttons yet. We just met. Can't find the buttons yet. <laughs> What do you think of the angle? What are your memories of participating? Is this the right way to get Ole out? How did it work out? Well, I think we drew some money. I mean, I know he beat me up a lot because I had wrestling there for a while. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my role whenever anybody left the horseman. Uh, I had to wrestle Luger when he left the horseman, too. Um, and it was, uh, and, and I don't remember it. Why, why was he really leaving? What, uh, do you remember? Was it uh, that he wanted to watch his son? It was watch his son wrestle, right? Yeah, he wanted. To, son was an amateur uh, college wrestler, and he wanted to. Right. I, I know that he he got fired right after that, or there was some heat somewhere. Did you have any fear that with with taking one of the original Beatles out that? It would hurt the music. No. You were that you were that confident that whoever was put in that place, the horseman machine. No, it wasn't the horseman machine. There were three people that it was the nucleus. And I think history has proven that. And uh, when when you take when you took Arn and me out of it, then it crumbled and they threw every piece of talent they had to try to revive it and you resurrect Paul, you it. You had Paul Roma in there, for Christ's sake. <sighs> yeah. This is a new man. I love it. <laughs> the, power of, the, the power of Christ, uh, let's just say. Um, I do want to ask you, though, about Oli's role as babyface. Are, are people just sometimes born heels? Well, yeah, I mean, Oli, Ole was not, but I mean, he was kind of a, the, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew was kind of, they were so entrenched in that area of the country that there is a time for a hot heel to be a babyface. Dusty was a great heel, and when he switched babyface, it, the, you know, he could never go back. And so you had, because of that toughness, and the people wanted somebody to, kick somebody's butt, you know. And so, you know, I think you've, you've got that kind of mentality thing going on, but the motivation behind it, I was not privy to the politics, but I can promise you it was politics. This is a time when the WWF is very heavy into gimmicks and costumes and characters, and, and we're still seeing in, in Crockett's territory, soon to be WCW, wrestlers competing every week. Should Crockett, in an attempt to catch that wave, created more characters like a Lasertron or something cartoony? Yeah, I don't I think so. Okay. The, the problem, and th this will be a somewhat lengthy answer, but Crockett didn't understand that we had a stronger company than the WWF at that time. We were drawing more crowds all across the country. And when he and ultimately, and they got into the, the wars and live television in the 90s, the people that were running WCW tried to become right. WWF, and we 
stayed apples and oranges instead of apples and apples. And you can't beat the WWF at apples and apples. Thus, you have an $87 million company in 2000 or 2001 or whenever mm -hmm. it was sell for $2 million. And, and to take that all back, we needed to be different. Right. We needed to be your McDonald's. We need to be Burger King. So... Uh, Hector Guerrero, how was he uh, as a talent? Uh, he was he was a good talent. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked with him, his younger brother, and his older brother, mm. and um, you know the the whole family was was talented. The junior heavyweight championship. Uh, the titles there throughout the eighties, but it always seemed like such. Uh, such a, a, a preliminary title. Um, what was its function? To try to create some interest in a maybe a smaller match. Okay. Got smaller. I mean, size match. Uh, physical, phys physical, physical, physical okay. size. Yeah, yeah, I didn't make a nickel off of those right. that I know of. <laughs> they were good. They didn't even send any to our house or anything. I mean, they didn't even have them in the building the night they debuted them. It was like, don't touch those. We only got two of them. Oh, what, to do photos, you mean? Yeah, or yeah. Uh, I mean, they didn't even give them to us to eat or anything. So you didn't like, get, like, cases no, of them to take home to the kids or anything? No, no. It's, it's not like getting a Miller Lite commercial. You get a case of beer ready. Yeah, right? one would think. And that's, and that's when you know that the nucleus is the same, okay? That as long as Rick and Arn and I were there, it didn't make any difference who the fourth was because we still drew m big money. Was the fan reaction uh, appropriate to Lex? I, I don't think that there was a glitch. Okay. How did he do, Lex, as a member of the Horsemen? Lex got exposed to a lot and learned a lot. Oh. With Crockett doing this now, he had just done it in Memphis. He had done it with Central States. And now he's, you mentioned before, going gobbling up the little... Is there uh, any intimidation on the part of the core locker room that there's going to be competition for spots now? As no. No. Confidence because of well, your I mean, spot. It, it was no because the the when you were with on on uh, WCW show mm -hmm. the Atlanta show mm -hmm. and and I mentioned it earlier. I mean, we'd go to these towns and we'd wrestle. I'd wrestle Dusty. Mm -hmm. Well, that buries all the local talent. Flair had wrestled Magnum. Flair had wrestled Wyndham. That buries all the local talent. Right, you're still on top. You know, I mean, their, their main event stuff was on the third match. So, I mean, it, it did nothing.
was the hope really that that he would be? It, was he initially hired to be the next big thing? I think as is I, sometimes reported. I think he was set to be the next Hogan. I don't know whose idea that was. I mean, here's a guy. He was. This is guy's another Outback Jack story. I, and I knew Tom from Calgary because he broke in in Calgary when I was there before I came to the WWF. He was in Calgary with me, and I had matches with him there, and I had boxing matches with boxing gloves on. And he was a big bodybuilder, in great physical condition. Uh, I don't know he was he had. I don't know where he what his brains were, but they weren't in his head. And, he could do all kinds of backflips and tumbling moves and karate and judo and he couldn't work in the ring worth a shit. Okay, but let, let's take that template. Can't work in the ring worth a shit. A couple of screws loose. Let's apply it to someone maybe who made some money. I love this guy. I don't even have to say it. He's there. So, so why does it work here and it doesn't work there? Like, what's the, what's I don't know. The See, there, there's a... The, Tom was missing charisma. Okay. Tom was missing that character projection mm -hmm. where he could look into the camera and make people believe that he was the mega man. He was this kind of person. He, he didn't have that ability. And, and the lack of that ability and the lack of that charisma, and I guess it would be a self-confidence type thing, uh, the warrior was able to do that. The warrior was able, as time went on, no matter how strange he was talking about the warriors in the universe, he 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 could project his character, mm -hmm. and, and he didn't have a problem doing it. And uh, Tom just, for some reason, he he would show up at the TV, TV tapings and he'd be dressed in a suit and tie. And he, walk around with a notebook taking notes and interviews and things like that. And he should have been dressed and out in the ring doing some, learning how to work. Mm -hmm. he, just, he never caught on, never caught on. You know, actually Las Vegas is a great city for wrestling because it, it, it has nothing to do with the tourist. It has nothing to do with people on the strip who come there. It has to do with the people who live in Las Vegas and who, who do the work there, just normal jobs like everyone else in any other city. And it was a good wrestling town. Now, remember, the old AWA went there once or twice a month True. and taped a TV show out of the old showboat and did very well or very successful. Those shows are on uh, ESPN Classics now or something, I think. So yeah, yeah, the, 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 the old shows. Yeah. But it was, uh, uh, it was, we, we didn't get to enjoy that kind of, we didn't go out to the strip or any of that stuff. We stayed in the Motel 6 or the Days Inn, right around the corner from the building. The building was over near the campus, just off the strip. We'd go do the show, be back midnight, in bed, and up the next morning and gone. Even with all the whorehouses? Didn't matter, nobody did anything. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the boys might go out to one of the strip clubs that was near there, but to nothing, nothing big. No one ever got in trouble in Vegas, ever. Okay. book talk about the measurement of guys members that was actually on our DVD uh, oh it was in a oh yeah we I heard about a that. board of uh, penis uh, sizes uh, from from the largest to the smallest and gave her a box full of names and had her uh, really fix the individuals that's, names to the, yeah that's incredible. and a big old a big old black one for Virgil too oh okay okay um, <laughs> Did you know uh, what was really well, planned for Missy? Well, how did you Missy? know Virgil had the big black one? Well, you know what? It was it was it was speculation, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, yeah. He was very I, proud of it. He was very proud of it. done anything with it? Uh, well, with, uh, besides brandish it to anyone who <laughs> look at it, from what I hear. Um, but uh, did, that's did, a, did you that's know Missy a was a thing though to be uh, immortalized or be remembered by what Missy Hyatt puts on the board according to your genitalia. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if you're the recipient of But I mean, of, you know, since this is not a family show, the size of a guy's cock. Yeah, we'll, we'll go for anything <laughs> on that show. But you were the first ever uh, You Shoot candidate, so you kind of set the set the uh, tone for that. 
We didn't have to do any of those games with you. Your mouth did the rest of it. <laughs> Missy, we have to give us some cocks to play with. Okay. But, but it worked. But it worked. It was great. Um, you weren't on the board anywhere, though. You should know. These were only people who had, we confirmed that Missy had seen the penis uh, in, in some in some fashion. Yeah. Things that we yeah. knew she yeah. had yeah. seen. Yeah. And, and there I, were plenty I, of them. I, 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 I have to admit, I, I never had the opportunity to... What, what would you say? How would you say that? To dip, Unveil? To dip the wick? Or? Dip the wick? I never had that opportunity, but uh, boy, she was the most beautiful girl at one time I'd ever seen. At one time? At one time. She actually called you while we were taping yeah, that show she did and call asked me. you about that, call by the way. Yeah, she, she's given me hell ever since about that. All of which available on kfabecommentaries.com. Now, when they do this fans are supposed to vote thing, they did it for you with the uh, yay or nay on the hot topic. Is this just a way for them to get names for the mailing list? Like, what's with the hot, You know, the one I did where Jesse Ventura had, had called in this vote, vote of confidence for me, it was all a bogus bullshit number. I mean, there was nobody to call in. It was not, the number was not even workable. There was no such thing. But uh, with the one Jimmy did, I'm sure it was probably the same bogus bullshit. Right. Now, whether it was to get people for a mailing list or get phone numbers or whatever, I, probably not. Uh, they have since had to be very legitimate. I found out at the Cyber Sunday thing because I, I, I personally, I thought it was like, it's going to be the same as the number Jesse put up on the screen for the vote of confidence. But it was very extremely legit. And, and, uh, yeah. and uh, I had to get dressed and go out and get in the ring to wrestle because I did win that vote very narrowly from Piper. Ah. You know, uh, the snake. But the, the, Ricky the Steamboat had that match for me as the agent for the Cyber Sunday. And I said, uh, what's the deal with this? Is all bullshit? He said, oh, no, it's legit. We have to we have to check it every so often. And mm -hmm. He said, we've cut, got a cutoff time that we'll cut it off and we stop it right there. How things have changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, "You kidding me?" He said, "No, it's, it's got to be real." So, and I'm, I'm, I would be with the first one to tell you if it was bullshit, and yeah. it was real. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, the WWF is getting some petitions at the time. I think from animal rights groups with the snakes and the dogs and all this shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, the uh, was this the same snake that Jake did? Jake travel with the snake? He had one. That he would travel with maybe for a month or, or, or two. I think they switched him at every TV tape and how it was done. Uh, okay. They would have the snake man from up in Connecticut, this kid that would, came around with the snakes. Jake's know more about this than I think he would bring the snakes around about at every TV tape, which was every third week. They would switch them out. Mm -hmm. Because about every three weeks, the snake has to be fed or something. So yes. We didn't yeah. want him eating Matilda. Right. Or Kamala, who was definitely afraid of the snake. And yeah. You guys had a little fun at his expense on more than one occasion, letting it go in the bathroom stall while he's sitting down. Yeah, gotcha. Um, by the way, the fans voted you know, um, in large numbers not to ban the not to ban the DDT, as so. one would uh, imagine. I ended um, up becoming victim to the DDT a few times. Speaking of Jack Tunney, because he delivered the um, DDT stays message. Um, he he was a very uncharismatic uh, choice. Of course, we know the Tony Wrestling family and the connection to Canada, but as the choice of the charismatic choice, why don't you just say boring bullshit? Why put him he as was, the television figurehead for the company? He looked legitimate, though. He looked like an authoritarian figure. He did actually. <laughs> He looked like the school principal who would bring you in and he had the big desk and the, the big chair and you sit in the small chair so you look minuscule to him. And, and, but he was, you know, I thought when I first got there he was legitimate. He was full of more shit than Christmas turkey too. Why did the Malkies achieve such a cult status as jobbers? Was it just the physical <laughs> milky white appearance? <laughs> I don't know. It was great, though. It was great. <laughs> um, job guys, regular job guys, could they hang with you guys after shows? 
Um, did they party with the boys? Was it was the cast system that we saw in the ring in place in the bars where they bring in you the drinks? Um, what was it like to be an enhancement talent in 1987 in the company? Well, they didn't go to the bars that we went to, if they went to the bars at all, and didn't stay and didn't hang. I mean, it, it, I don't know that it was a class uh, thing, but you know, you just didn't, I mean, a lot of the guys didn't stay where we stayed. You're working for the other major competitor in the company, to, uh, country to WWE. So, how aware are you of what the other guys are doing? Like, do you know WrestleMania sets the attendance record? Are you curious to see the matches on tape? Um, I don't know that I was curious to see the matches. I mean, you certainly know what they're doing, um, and but it's you know a lot of their a lot of the people that they they had were people that I mean I just got done working a big program with Steamboat right in '84 uh, before he left and went up there mm -hmm. you know uh, Vince hired Valentine and Piper and they both worked for Crockett so you know I mean Vince it seems like his his mo was wait for some any opposition at all wait for them to get stars and then hire them away. They ripen on the vine and he just picks the fruit. Exactly. I mean, did the same thing with me and Arn. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and it seemed pretty successful for him. What did Crockett think of Vince? Uh, don't know. Never had that conversation. How about Dusty? Was Dusty ever vocal about what was, as he was booking, what was going on in New York? I, I was never privy to those those conversations, mm -hmm. because when I when we were on the jet, I usually rode with the pilots. I enjoyed sitting up front, oh. and uh, so I missed a whole bunch of Gaga. And uh, I mean, the the guys let me fly the jet for 400 miles one day, and uh, with no experience training anything. Well, we were already up in the air. I mean, it's hard. To, <laughs> I mean, you'd never taken a flying lesson. No. Okay. But I took I took the plane from twenty eight thousand feet down to like fourteen, and uh, you know kept it where we were going, and and so that was pretty cool. But it, the the view from up there with all the windows around you at night and stuff, oh, it was unbelievable. Right. And uh, it was just I loved it. Talk about the week leading up to the event. Is it it's loaded with press and promos and radio stations, news, all that stuff. What kind of ringer do they put you through? I didn't have to do a lot of it because our match was not the one of the feature feature matches up the card. Now Hogan and Andre, uh, obviously, they had to do a ton of that that work that week, and uh, we were we were still out doing wrestling shows, and uh, most of our stuff had already been pre-taped anyway. And we didn't do a lot of live things at all. No. Okay. So I wasn't involved in any of that part of it. So you get to town the night before, I guess, because you're, yeah. you're working somewhere else. Um, is, it, is it just like the night before any other show? I mean, everybody gets into town? And... I, I would suppose, yeah, because yeah. we had our rental cars and we drove out to the building. There's no bus to take us. We didn't all load up and everybody go together or, or you know, none of this nonsense. And uh, my wife and kids weren't there. There was no family. There were no families there that mm. I remember. It's not like, well, do you want to bring someone with you? You can bring a guest, and if you want to bring your family, you now we can pay for one, but we can't pay for if you're Mormon, pay for fifteen of you. <laughs> but now the the day of the show, you, do you have to get there early? Day of the show is not really. They there was I think it, I think if I remember right, that was about an eleven o'clock call as opposed to noon. Oh, okay. maybe an hour early. Just well, normally it's because traffic. They said traffic's gonna be bad. 
because we had heard they had like 60 or 70,000 tickets sold. Mm -hmm. Then we heard it's 80,000, and we heard it's going to be sold out, so you might ought to leave early. Mm. <laughs> what about backstage, the atmosphere backstage? Is it fever pitch? Nah. Really? Just burn out. Everyone was burnt. Everyone was burnt out. Dirty clothes, dirty everything. We stunk like pigs. And, yeah. Um, celebrities are always a part of celebrities WrestleMania. Celebrities part of it. Uh, no. Mary Hart, Bob Euchre, Aretha yes. Franklin. Any? Yeah. Uh, I didn't get to see Aretha Franklin at all. I didn't didn't see her not one time. I did an interview with uh, Mary Hart, mm -hmm. and no still photos with any of them. Uh, the fun. I, I didn't do the interview with Bob Euchre, but I've since. Bob and I have talked, and then uh, some of Bob's people in Milwaukee that work with the brewers that I know. When Andre put his hands and shook Bob's head, it's got to be the funniest thing with Euchre's eyes going. <laughs> I, I, I tell Bob every time I said, that's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. What a great piece of work. He worked more than once, right? Was yeah, he was in a couple of, couple, of yeah. couple, two or three. He must have enjoyed it. Do you remember uh, that Samantha Fox, who was an 80s British uh, singer and like pinup girl kind of thing, she was supposed to be there to be part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the crowning, the coronation match with, uh, and then it was just dropped. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know anything about it. I do remember the name. Uh, keep in mind now, this WrestleMania three, this big event, as big as it was, did not have a little ton of celebrities like they load them up no. in the past. No. Uh, and, and, and now, even the, the, the WrestleManias they have now are loaded up with all these celebrities and banquets and parties. and It's, it's more like a, uh, a Super Bowl event now as opposed to this was just a big mega wrestling show that we had. This is one of the four that we had every year. Right. Uh, by the way, the uh, very suitable replacement for the uh, large-chested pinup model, Samantha Fox, for that night, who couldn't be there, was... Uh, uh, Lillian Ellison, uh, fabulous. <laughs> um, so the final count was ninety three thousand one hundred seventy three that packed in, and uh, it uh, some of it papered, I guess, but uh, it set the North American attendance record. Um, the uh, the local promoter for the event, uh, Zane Bresloff, says that the actual number is probably closer to seventy eight thousand. How does the papering work? Is it is it giveaways? Uh, in order to put a, a, every ass, a, 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 uh, an ass in every seat? Not, not particularly. Probably there was, uh, you know, from what I understand now, going back to the, the, the Tampa WrestleMania of 2008, from what I understand, that, that particular building was not sold out, and they had reduced ticket sales just prior to the show. So... Uh, now, mind you, I'm, I, that's what I heard, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Now, on the, this WrestleMania three in Detroit, I can tell you that on any big event, whether it be the Super Bowl or the NBA playoffs or anything, there's X amount of comp tickets given out, whether it be the radio stations, TV stations, media people get tickets, the media people get to bring someone with them. I found out that from my friend who books a lot of NFL players that every NFL player gets two tickets to the Super Bowl. Well, there's, what, 15, 1,600 of them? Mm. So you're talking about 1,500 times two. Uh, so that's 3,000 tickets that's given away just to players. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And if they want to buy tickets, then they can buy tickets at 500 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I didn't take any comps. I didn't know we could even get a comp. Maybe no one asked me for comps, but I'm sure that, that, that some of the wrestlers, uh, probably the gym guys in Detroit, whoever were, Mm -hmm. at the, uh, where we went to work out, they probably had tickets for them. Maybe Hogan got them a couple, and Beefcake might have got them a couple, and everyone, some of their members came. And of course, at the building itself, you got the super, uh, this uh, uh, Silver Dome out there. And of course, the building itself is going to have corporate sponsors yes. for the building. They're going to want tickets. So it's probably easy to say that, sure, there could have been 20,000 comps. You know, I didn't see it until I watched some of it, and by the I was showering, and then I got I saw the ending of the match, and uh, I've later since watched it all, watched the whole match. Uh, it was very good, mm -hmm. very good. Because Andre was a great worker in the ring, and Hogan was also. They they could both uh, work a crowd very well, and for for Hogan to be in with the Giant, that's not the first match he'd ever had with Andre. He did several matches with him in years gone by. 
So, so it was, uh, I thought it worked very well. Okay. Uh, went very good, I thought it did. It went to Jake, let me do the stuff that I wanted to do. Uh, he was, uh, Jake's always been a professional in the ring. He's never been selfish at all. The part that didn't go as well as we thought would was when Alice Cooper was supposed to use the snake on Jimmy Hart, but when Alice Cooper saw the, the first snake that was there, the snake itself, and here's Alice Cooper been handling snakes in his, in his uh, uh, stage <clears throat> show for years, Oh, I've never seen this like, you know, Missy talking about the boys and the size of their things. I've never seen one this big. I've never handled one like this. So, so he was not sh sure that he could handle this size of a snake. So, but he's to, Jake is, I caught the fall on Jake, one, two, three, and I slide out, and he catches Jimmy Hart, puts him in a, in a full Nelson to hold Jimmy while Alice is going to get the snake. Well, Alice took a little bit more time than he should to get the snake than he did get the snake out. And Jimmy was screaming and kicking. Jake had to really squeeze and hold him. And, and I thought Jimmy might have been... Jimmy didn't like the snake anyway. He was like Junkyard Dog and some more and Kamala and some people just didn't like the snake at all. And Jimmy didn't like the snake and he wouldn't really... Yeah, 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 I'll do it. Yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Sure, man, just put it on me. But when, what we say in the business, when the nut cutting came, then he was, if you watch it, he's kicking and screaming and he's got the veins in his head. And, yeah, and Jake was having to really squeeze and hold him. Jimmy came out of that after it was over for the next week or so with his neck and really sore and hurting because, but Jake said, hey, man, why are you trying to get away from me? Yeah. You know, it's nothing going to happen. But Jimmy just really, when it, the time came, he was afraid of the snake. How, how was Alice uh, backstage? Just met him prior to the event, and was he did some promo stuff with Jake, and I wasn't really around, but he was fine. He was okay. There again, he was a Detroit guy from Detroit, so it worked out well that he was there, and at that time he was... Uh, Jake had already started promoing Alice Cooper and everything... Jake kind of set the stage to have Alice Cooper involved in this. Mm -hmm. He kind of planted the seed early on, you know, with this darkness type thing and the snakes. And, oh, that'd be great, man. That's, that'd be great, Vince. We need to get Alice Cooper in here. Huh? Now, when, when celebrities are involved with the WrestleManias or any wrestling event, did back then, and now, you know, it's been revealed to all be a, a show of wrestling, but did they get it? Were they respectful of what you were doing? They understand it's, it. I, you know, guys like Bob Uecker did. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, Cooper, I don't think he really did understand it. Now that the, this wrestler movie's come out with Mickey Rourke, he has a whole different take on, on wrestling and what the wrestlers do and, and how we accomplish what we do. Actors aren't wrestlers. Wrestlers aren't really actors. And it doesn't cross over. Uh, the Vanna White, she did a couple of those, I think, with us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they understand what their position is, and they do it. I think the one that got, other than other than Bob Euchre, uh, the fellow that played the piano, who was... Liberace? Liberace? No, 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 no. Uh, not Liberace. The older fellow who passed away not long ago wore the glasses. Steve uh, Allen. Steve Allen yeah. got it. Well, Steve Allen had done wrestling before yeah, from yeah, L.A. That's true. Steve yeah. Allen had been involved in the wrestling business as a commentator and doing things. He understood it, and he was very good with, with the wrestlers. Uh, some of these other celebrities, like that Run DMC, they were on uh, WrestleMania 6 or 7, one of those. They didn't come around and be around the wrestlers at all. The other guy that smoked the cigarettes that was big in New York all the time, Martin, Martin Downey. Downey. Yeah. Martin Downey was good because he had had, he had wrestlers on his show before, and, right. and uh, he was okay. Uh, but sometimes you, especially the women, the women actor, actors and actresses, uh, they're not, not too up on it at all. <clears throat> For the yeah. big uh, Intercontinental title. This is largely regarded as the match of the show. Uh, some call it one of the best matches ever. What do you think? 
I know it was heavily, heavily scripted by Savage, as he was known to do often. It was it was a good match. I, I'm not going to take that away from him. And and for a big event, it was a longer match than most people get to have. And they had that long match because it it. it I think the longer match worked in. It worked in in Savage's favor to make him. It actually made him look a lot better. And because Steamboat could always do the long matches anyway. Mm -hmm. He'd been known for doing that even in the NWA days. But uh, uh, I just saw bits and pieces of it. It was, to me, it's a match that I'd seen them have before. Uh -huh. It was a typical Steamboat, typical Savage match. I'd seen, I, I know both of their, their, their ring work, so it wasn't anything out of the ordinary for me. Exciting for the fans, probably, yes. I, I would say the stuff that Jake and I did was probably just as exciting. We didn't have to do as much as them or go as long. So it wasn't like all the workers were huddled around the monitors. Oh no, nobody. Said, that, I, I, that group of guys I was with, they didn't do that. Right. They didn't do that. You think Don Morocco cared about that? He's he didn't care. <laughs> when, in fact, when you get Don, you ask him, "Did, did you guys sit around the monitors and watch?" He's like, "Hell no." <laughs> what were your thoughts on that? Uh, guys were playing cards and stuff. They went, somebody was getting get Andre a bottle of wine or something like that. I mean, nobody was watching. Did we they, didn't sit around. I don't know where they're sitting around a month. It happens today, doesn't it? Uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah. Think they, I think they do. They're like, oh, man, they're all sitting there like goo 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 eyes over this. I didn't even watch. I was at the Cyber Sunday. I did not see one match. I was at the Raw show the night after. I did not watch one match. I got in a corner. I dressed by myself where no one was there. No one saw me until time for me to go for rehearsal. And I came back, sat back in the corner, went out, did my thing, came back, got undressed, and left the building. Mm -hmm. They even called me on a cell phone to find out if I if I knew what time to be there. I said, yeah, I've, I've been here for two hours. I'm in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Did Savage work all of his matches that meticulously scripted? I say scripted, I mean that, that predetermined spots for the Steamboat match, he numbered them. Yeah, uh, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as far as to say all of them, but on, on, if anything was going to change, or if it was going to be a different match than the one that we were doing, especially he and I, if we were going to do a different match because of different circumstances that maybe it was a, uh, 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 what do you call it, a lumberjack match where the guys around the ring so some things yeah. change, yeah. then yes, that had to be rescripted. And other on, than that, it was on, the same on, match on, every night. Pretty much, but he still had to go over it. How about uh, working with Steamboat? It was good. It was easy. It was yeah. fun. Uh, he and I had similar styles. He was slow and deliberate in what he did, and I was slow and deliberate in what I did. And hey, when it come time for him to make his comeback, I was there to feed him and do all the bumps for him and do the things that he needed. Same as working with Jimmy Snook was very, very similar to working with Steamboat. Uh, Jake's the same way. Very slow, deliberate style of work where uh, the people get to see what you're doing, mm -hmm. and they get to, they get to absorb it before you go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. It's not that bing 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 Adrian pulled out all the stops in that match. He was doing upside down flip over the top like like Ric Flair's uh, uh, standard move in every match of his. But Adrian, uh, gosh, he went nuts in that and lost his hair. And that was a good piece of business. Mm -hmm. That did pretty good. Did uh, I think Piper should have lost his hair though? And then have a rematch, and then Adrian loses hair. And stretch it out a little. Yeah. Did, did Piper I'm break like, his wrist uh, prior to this? Uh, is it true that he electrocuted himself 10 I days just, prior? Now, see this electrocution thing. I, I kind of have to dispute that because... Let's hear it. I, I know the building. I was there. And I had left the building. It was Milwaukee, the old Milwaukee Arena. And they have the dressing room lights, like in the old dressing room with the light bulbs around the mirrors. And, and I don't know how you could break the light bulb and then get electrocuted by touching the filament in the bulb, because once you break the bulb, there is no more electricity going into that filament. Okay. If that's what happened. Now, 
Did he stick his finger in an open socket? If he did, what the hell was he on? How the hell are you showering and you come in and drying off and you stick your finger? Let me look. What is that in there? It's... <coughs> is there something white in there? <coughs> I don't get that one. Then I found out later on. Now here's here he is. Oh, Roddy got electrocuted last night. Roddy says, oh my God. What do you mean? Oh, he's got electric. The story was he had electricity still running through his body. <laughs> Swear to you, I know it's bizarre. Yeah. This is the most fucked up shit I ever heard. He what? So then I see him about two days later. And he's walking around going, I said, what the fuck's the matter with him? Well, you know he got electrocuted. He's still got electricity running. The electricity's not still in your body. What the? Come hell? to find out, I guess he was practicing for a movie role. Really? Yeah. I suppose that's what it was. He would walk around and just shimmer. <clears throat> Well, I'll tell you what, this might have been some people believed it, but by God, I didn't. <laughs> if you ever get a chance, you should ask him about the electrical event. and, and <laughs> The electrical event. How long, how, how long did know. the electricity stay in your body? <laughs> yeah. Uh, any, anything else memorable from that WrestleMania? Little Beaver? Uh, um, the the, uh, the, uh, the four-star butchery Coco Beware match? I mean, I mean what... Uh, uh, Harley Race Junkyard Dog. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had a chance to see that one later on. Uh, and I, when I did see Harley, uh, a few years after that, I, I gave him the highest regards of, of a good match with a guy that was very difficult. Yes. And Harley put that match together and made this fellow look fantastic. And, and that's not an easy chore to do. After the event, um, Hogan comes back, the show's over, Hogan comes back to the curtain. Is there the standing round of applause that happens today sometimes for, uh, for the workers when they come back? Or, they, or you're playing cards and get ready to go home? Yeah, everybody was getting dressed, trying to get ready to beat the traffic if they could and haul ass out of there. Does Vince come in and say anything after a big show like this to the nah, room? Or? Nah, nah. Huh? If he was, if he would have said anything, he'd went to Andre and Hogan wherever they might have been dressing. Andre always dressed what the wrestlers did. Hogan, by then he was, uh, you know, had his own private locker room. What is it? Everybody's got to have a private locker room. What's the matter? We don't. We're not your friend anymore. We're not worthy of dressing in the same locker room with you anymore. But when you want to take that big old nasty crap, you come back to where the boys are. Leave that for us. Where's the party that night? Don't Remember? come back there and do it in the locker room where we are. Do it in your own lo private locker room. Go up there where the, the men's room and the public toilet is before they let the people in. <laughs> it's electricity, it's in me. It's still in you. It's still in you. You stuck your finger in that socket in 1986. I can't believe it. That was the most bizarre thing I'd ever heard in my... I heard a lot of good stories. That's awesome. When Jim Nyhart called Vince and said he had cat scratch fever, that's why he couldn't make some shows. But to have Piper walk around with electricity still in his body, that's bizarre. I, 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 I believe Jim is still trying to pass that off as a legitimate uh, illness. I saw an interview with him <laughs> that, that, that actually does exist, which is ridiculous. Okay. I, I, where I was the party that night? Where there was, the was party no party. Then? We went back to our... Uh, no big catered no, affair? No, no, on, no, 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 no. On we, we, went back, we went back to our hotels or wherever it was and loaded up and was at the TV the next day at noon to start uh, uh, TV taping. Yeah, they were, uh, I, I, you know, it's a tough way for Ken who, 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 you know, with 
everything that had happened to him to then have to do these vignettes of him being like he's locked up in prison again and to come out. But he came out and he did very well after that. The people, the fans really didn't care. They didn't right. care that, that anything had happened to him. They'd, uh, his first match back was uh, shot, but then had to be retaped, I'm told, because it was so poor. Probably. Did they, did I mean, they do that in the past for a TV tape and make you go out and Oh, do yeah, it? yeah. They, they sent uh, Morocco and a junkyard dog and out back out one time, and we were in uh, Washington, D.C., the Capitol Center, 20,000 people for Saturday night main event. It wasn't right. And mm -hmm. so they came through the curtain, and he told them to go back and do it again. He had some matches against you, uh, Ken. Uh, yeah, Ken, a lot of times. Well, those were the ones we talked about earlier when Jake was not around. Gotcha. Or Steamboat was not around. Uh, Steamboat had quit the company and was uh, he had to be substituted. So then uh, I had a lot of matches with Ken. Easy matches for me. I, Ken and I worked very well together. I, I knew what to do. I, I was from that old Southern Memphis style where. Uh, and he was the strong man, and I knew he was a strong man, Ken Patera, and we did let him, I let him do all his strong man stuff and throw me around like a rag doll, and when it came time, Jimmy hit him from behind, and I'd get him down, beat him up real good, and then he'd make his little comeback. And it was easy for him. I, I didn't like to be pick me up, and, but he would do it. I said, this is not throw, because the rings were hard, but he would pick me up and just toss me way out there on this big, boom, down I'd go. Very unforgiving rings yeah. of the WWF of the 80s. I want you to tell a very funny story about when Vince would walk by and Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He would come by and, or maybe I was on the set getting ready to do an interview or standing talking. He'd come by and he'd take a look at me. Flick the thing in front of the hair there of mine. I'd say, uh -uh, don't even think about it. I'll be retired living <laughs> on the lake before that happens. And, uh, you know, I kind of wish they would have gone with it uh, in a way because for me to have a hair match with Brutus and for me to actually lose the hair would have been a, a major, major event. It would have been good for the fans. It would have been good for the company. And, of course, I could have negotiated probably a, a decent payday out of it. At, and at that point in time, going in the program with Brutus, I could have used the payday. And, and, uh, but it didn't come about. And, and, and Brutus went on then to, in another program, I think, with we talked earlier with Ron Bass. I mm -hmm. know Ron Bass. Right. Actually, I was the second person to do that. Paul Arndorf was the did the original one and jumped Hogan. Hogan, I think. yes, and absolutely right. Yes. They, they, this was a rehash of, a, of another angle, and it worked. Also, it worked for Paul with his deal with Hogan, and it worked with myself and Jake. Yeah, mm -hmm. no one in the audience knew that that was me. I mean, we had I had the dead gum jumpsuit. Fuck, why do I always get stuck wearing that fucking suit all the time? So I, I had to put the suit on. It's like, you know, if I just pull the mask off, wouldn't you recognize me? I mean, would you not recognize me? Why do you need the suit, right? <laughs> Why punish the guy anymore? I got I to gotta walk around in a suit all day so nobody sees me. And I got to wear Lombardi's mask that he's been wearing. Somebody went, ugh. <laughs> So, but anyway, I like Steve. He's fine. He's good. He, he's he's a nice guy to me. Anyway, uh, so I got to wear this thing, and the whole time out there, no, I, no one in that building, no one on te on television, knew that was me, because I kept the, the collar of the suit tucked in and had the thing, and when I pulled it off, and it was me under there. Holy cow! That place went nuts. Mm -hmm. It was a good little spot. I liked it. May twenty. That was the first. Excuse me, that was the first day I saw royalty checks from the dolls, the rubber dolls, the big yeah. rubber dolls that was South Bend, Indiana. They had gotten their royalty checks, and uh, unbelievable. I heard Iron Sheik had like 80 or 90,000 dollars in Nikolai. And Hillbilly Jim came over and he says, You ain't gonna believe it. we just got our check. I got 85,000. What? Eight, yeah, 85. 
Unbel- and this was for like three months of this dial money. Mm. It was crazy. Yeah. It's hard to believe. And I said, damn, I hope they make a doll of me. And they did. <laughs> well, they, I never got no 80 grand. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what Hogan's check was? Oh, That'd be an interesting interview. Just I, would the full inter- I would love to just interview him on his paydays. Fuck that. I interview his accountant so you get the truth. Well, he couldn't tell the truth now. What did you think of Stan uh, as a replacement for that team? Stan was, was a good talent. Um, and the Midnight, you know, they, they didn't miss a beat. Which version of the Midnight Express did you like better? Uh, Dennis and Bobby or Bobby and Stan? Um, I don't know that I, I had a like either way. I liked Stan and I always knew Stan more as a baby face. So you had some of those tendencies there, but we were just getting ready to work with with um, Bobby and Stan when Arn and I left. So we never really got to do that. What was it like wrestling Wahoo? I mean, are the chops as ridiculous as they yes. appeared to be? Yes. I mean, when you look down and your chest is bleeding, that's pretty choppy. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what it's like being in the ring with Wahoo. I've never <laughs> wrestled him. I know you're <laughs> shocked looking at my physique. <laughs> you know, I mean, it. it the thing, the thing that is is absolutely when. You go to the ring, when I go to the ring, and you work with a guy like Wahoo, or you work with a guy like Magnum TA, the intensity level is so strong. And when Wahoo chops you or Magnum punches you and belly to belly you, there, there's not a, a ounce of disbelief in the building. Right. And I thrived on that. And you, you were able to take wrestling fans on a journey. And thus, you got to entertain them because you could take them on a journey. And they would leave. And, and my goal every night that I went to the ring was to make the people scream the longest and the loudest. And there were a lot of nights that I did, and there were a lot of nights that other people had them scream longer and louder. But nonetheless, that was my goal every night, whether I was on third or last. Mm -hmm. And you could do that much easier with Magnum and Wahoo and people in that vein because the credibility was there right. already in the in the work yeah. yeah and i mean th- there wasn't anybody on the back row or the front row that said ah oh, that wasn't real right <laughs> um how about why we talked about bob armstrong maybe getting a little bit difficult to get off his head was wahoo get off his feet oh wahoo was great yeah okay oh wahoo could sell and come back i mean he couldn't he couldn't trade a bunch of uh wrestling holds but he could sell and come back. (laughs) He leaves to go to the AWA. This is about a year or so removed from the last time uh, Crockett and Vern worked together. Right. Um, Are you aware of the relationship between those two companies in 87, AWA and Um, and Crockett? Well, I mean, Crockett was having that relationship with all the independent NWA and AWA. Anybody that wasn't the WWF, I mean, he was trying to have that relationship Mm -hmm. uh, with all of them. And, uh, you know, and, and if he could have planted some of his stars in with them, it might have been an easier transition. At least that's probably, this is, th- this is as much as I, I actually learned about it at the time. Um, you know, it, it, it is, I mean, it didn't work, so it, 
didn't work. Right. You know, but Wahoo was still a great talent, and and uh, the and he was key, key to Crockett becoming WCW, and the turnaround, mm. because when Dusty came in as the Booker, and I had that conversation with him, and Wahoo wrestled Flair, and I wrestled Dusty. Those two matches changed everything in the ter in the company, and we w we started making money. And then it was easy as Magnum came in and Midnight came in and all the other added pieces of talent that they were adding uh, all came in, and uh, Arn came in at that time and and uh, uh, was Flair's cousin or nephew or or something, and him and Ole right. were. You know, so all of these pieces are pre-horsemen, but they're all being put together. But all they had the greatest talent that uh, may have been put together, except maybe in New in Indianapolis in the early '60s when my dad was there, and uh, uh, it was uh, God. That I've, I've got a softball picture at home that my dad had because they used to go around and play softball teams in the summer. And I mean, you've got the Shires brothers, and you've got Nick Bockwinkel, and Cowboy Bob Ellis, and and Gene Kaniski, and Wilbur Snyder, and the Bruiser, the and Bruiser, blah, blah, blah. yeah, in one spot, yeah. Uh, you know, that was everybody. And they and they played softball. Oh gosh, it was wow. it was unbelievable. And uh, that's hilarious. Now I'm telling you something about the history. That's right. Well, I, I, what's up? I what's get wrong the, with that? I get the best education in the world <laughs> in this spot. Tell me about the second Crockett Cup. Uh, give me a sense of what it's like to be there behind the scenes for the two-day two tournament. You didn't have to travel. You could That's stay in the true. Same hotel room. Go to Sabatino's for two nights. And that was? You've never been to Sabatino's? No. I'm less of a person for this, clearly, but you can tell me what it is. Restaurant, it bar, is, It is probably strip one, club. Of the, one of the finest Italian restaurants, and it's in Baltimore. In right? Baltimore. Oh, that was our spot every, every time in Baltimore. Still standing, do you know? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, tell me about the city of Baltimore. Wrestling city? Huge. Very, very much didn't like the horsemen. Whereas you were probably cheered a few miles north in Philly. Probably. We had a discussion earlier about Talk to me about that regionalization of fans. How such a short distance between two cities can produce two completely different arenas. Not a clue. I mean, it is just watch the same TV show and... Uh, <laughs> just crazy but Baltimore I mean it was it was it was dangerous in Baltimore and we stayed right across the street in the Marriott right from right from the Civic Arena you just have to walk across the street to okay. go to work I mean it was it was different going across the street there and uh, and and don't know why but it was and uh, but it was it was huge you team with Lex? Do you like teaming with Lex? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, it didn't make any difference. I mean, it was, uh, that was at, that was at, that was before Arn and I started teaming. Right. Do you know why? He's put with Sullivan for this tournament. Don't know why. Wouldn't have been more natural to have? Well, I, I don't know. No, because we were, we were just going up the ladder to get beat. So, I mean, it. It, uh, okay. Um, and that was, I think we wrestled the Armstrongs in the in the semifinal, the one I watched the other night. Right. <laughs> well, which I'm going to go home and put on immediately. <laughs> you and Luger worked three fairly long matches in one night, and you have four overall in the tournament, more than any other team in the, in the tournament. Uh, um, what is it like working three long matches in one night? Well... Well, to you, to the lay person, it's not well. It's, it's grueling, is it not? Well, I mean, it was probably grueling. When you see that tape, I spent most of the time in the ring. Uh, but it was, 
uh, you know, but I mean, we were in shape to do that stuff. Was Lex able to keep up? Yeah. Okay. You were very popular in a lot of towns, maybe not in Baltimore, but in a lot of towns, you, you're getting like a baby face pop as a heel. Is it harder to be a heel when you're so over as a heel that you're almost a baby face? I don't, I don't know that I was ever that way. The horsemen are, but I don't think I was. People wanted to like Arn, they wanted to like Rick, and they didn't want to like me. I kept us, I kept the group pulled back the other direction. Why are you so hateable? Ah, just good at it. Where would you get your stuff as a heel? <laughs> Out of my brain, but I had a lot of inspiration. You've got to be consistently, not many people in the world have to be consistently unlikable and find new ways to do that to keep people pissed off at you. <laughs> I, would, I would watch people uh, on television, on soap operas. I would watch people drive down the highway. I would watch, I mean, who hadn't been pissed off at the guy that, that jerks across and, and flips you off and, and you're looking at him, you know, I mean, that kind of mentality and you just see people at the store two people get in an argument at a grocery store. And if you've watched it for any, any amount of time or watched it start, you know, how did it, how did it happen or, or whatever? You know, what, what did somebody say? Hey, lady, you need to watch your kid over here, you know? And, you know, and I would just, any time I was always, always had my antennas up and, and. Uh, well, this is interesting. So you're looking for inspiration in, in the worst qualities of people in the real world, not television, not lyrics of songs, you're looking at bad guys well, just in real life, as, as or, you, or angry as, people. As, you, as it happens, you know, and you're watching spontaneity, and, and then when I could put that into real life stuff, it worked. You have a match against the, uh, uh, against the Japanese team of Baba and Takagi in the uh, quarterfinals here. And uh, talk to me about working with a foreign team where English is limited. Can you, can you call spots with a language barrier like that? I assume Baba spoke English, right? Uh, some, I think. Okay. Is it tougher to communicate? Uh, well, um, the, the thing, you, we need to have a seminar on, on how to perform. Um, I communicated very little in the ring. I mean, it was just do it. By feel, you could. Well, you just, I mean, my, my whole philosophy was think real. Right. Right, but I mean, if you shoot me in, like coming off, I, I kind of have to know if you're going to go with a boot or a drop kick or an elbow or no, something. To... No, you, you don't. I don't? No. Okay. You need to know if I'm going to give you a backdrop. Okay. Or if I want you to duck the elbow, but, right. but if I'm going to hit you or punch you or kick just, you, you don't need to know I don't that. need to know. Just be ready for anything. <clears throat> well, it, it needs to be done in a way that if I was going to do something like that, I did it close enough to the ropes that you, didn't, you couldn't miss it anyway. Okay. You think Dusty and Nikita were good choices to win the tournament? I... Didn't make me any difference. Didn't matter. You were still drawn as a member of the Horsemen. I was still getting paid. That's right. <laughs> I was getting paid to make people look good. <laughs> you got to know what your role is. Very good. Are you guys unhappy being behind the camera? There you have it. You're not at all concerned with bloat to the roster, too much too soon. As a company concern, maybe not your spot in the company, but Jesus, what are we going to do with all these people? Well, the that was not my job. Okay. My only concern would have been is if in the middle of all this, coliseums were half full instead of completely full. If they're being sold out, 
you roll. Right. And the booking and who's doing what to who and whatever is up to the people that are getting paid to do that. It's my job to fill buildings and that's what we did. When he would first buy a company, you guys would kind of be inserted into that territory and working with the guys that were there. Um, he'd frequently, as happens here, send someone down to win the heavyweight title. Right. Um, do you think he was ever considering keeping the satellite promotions going and running the UWF as a UWF? I don't think so. No, he, he was eventually I, I mean, just going to make it one. Th they, never did, they never did that with anybody, so I don't think so. And what they did by, by sending Big Bubba down there, I mean, you go in and, and you beat their champion right. right there, so they immediately, the national guys come in and they, you elevate your own product and bury the other company. So, I mean, it was, that has, I mean, that was five territories you just, right. they did the same MO, so they had to be doing it on purpose. We talked about Wahoo and, and Magnum as being people that you were, that you knew were there in the ring with you. Oli the same thing? Oh, yeah. Oli, Oli was stiff, but, but it was, Oli was a heel. So, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't the, the, the cell comeback guy. Right. You know, so, I mean, it was more of a, I watched some of that match sometime in the re recent past. Mm-hmm. But I didn't watch all of it, so it must not have been very good. Well, I was going to say, were you happy with what you were seeing now? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> because? Do you remember? Was there any oh, precipitating? It, no, it, no, just, it, just you know. It, Are you too critical? Um, I don't know. You know, Ole was always in charge of his matches, and... I was always in charge, so we probably had some <laughs> Power crea <struggle>? creative differences. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> now he leaves in May. Do you? I know you're not involved in the Gaga, but are you hearing anything? Dusty, this, is he fired? Is he fired at Dusty's urging? Crockett's? Not a clue. Not a clue. Didn't call up your old buddy Oli and say, "What? What the hell happened?" No. 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 I was, we were selling out everywhere and I didn't care. Talk to me about Robert Gibson. Was he underrated? I mean, he kind of played the second fiddle to Ricky. Um, most of the attention went to Ricky. Does Robert get enough credit for his contributions, do you think? Oh, I think the fact that you you remember the Rock and Roll Express. Yeah. That was because both of them were there. Okay. Both of them played a role, and I'd like to know how many people joined their fan club for whatever they had to pay to, to join the fan club. We got the number on the. You can get the timeline, the history of WCW, 1986, with the Rock and Roll Express <laughs> for the answer to that. <laughs> The it better was, question, Tully, is probably, how much they saw from the profits that Crockett made selling the 1995 fan club experience to a million people, I think is what I was quoted. Whoa. Um, they didn't see 19 million, let me tell you. I promise. Um, Ricky Morton, always talked about as the great baby face sell and, and kind of like throwing a puppy dog around the ring. Was he fun to abuse? Oh, yeah. So many of you did it. Oh, yeah. And did it well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, he did it well. <laughs> he, it That's was, poignant, though. I want you to expand oh, yeah. on that. Well, I mean, it was, there, there's a difference in selling and dying. And Ricky sold and didn't die. But the fact that he was fighting to get the tag to Robert, right. which nowadays you don't, Tag matches, if a guy's not making his own comeback and then giving the guy a dead tag, you haven't seen it. 
I mean, it, th that's every tag match I've ever seen. This may be the worst Crockett show ever booked. I'm going to go down the card, and I just want your uh, honest reactions to this card. Where was it at? Uh, Hicksville, Virginia. Uh, 850 unfortunate fans bear witness to this lineup. Uh, Mark Fleming defeats David Diamond. Denny Brown beats John Savage. Gary Royal defeats Mark Fleming again. Uh, Nelson Royal defeats Rocky King. The Italian Stallion beats Larry Stevens. Vladimir Petrov beats Todd Champion. And Jimmy Valiant, clearly the biggest name on the card, tags with the Italian Stallion to defeat Chris Champion and Sean Royal via, via disqualification in the main event. D was everybody snowbound somewhere and they, and they had to, to reuse talent? We have two people working twice. I can't imagine that this was the poster. What day of the week was that? Uh, that's a good question. That's the one thing I don't have. I could tell you it was May 20th, but... Um, Where is everybody else working? Oh, maybe a double... I mean, maybe you guys had two other shows or something, may, right? And may this have was been the third. Three. Right. And this is what was left. Right. All right. You're not there, uh, we should say, but... Um, do you even remember Mark Fleming? Yeah. You do? Okay. Norfolk, Virginia. All right. Well, he worked he twice on this show. He actually just released a book this year, uh, I guess about his time in 1987, <laughs> working twice in Hicksville, Virginia. Billy came back and the business had, had, the WWF business had outgrown what superstar Billy Graham had been for so many years. This big muscular guy that was, could talk and do all these things, but the business itself had grown way past his days of selling out Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. To sell out Madison Square Garden was no big deal anymore. Right. I mean, it was just not a big deal. Because uh, we were selling out three towns a night everywhere we went. Uh, and Billy was not in uh, physically able to keep up that kind of pace, and he was lucky to be in in in, in, in matches with uh, with uh, Butch Reed because Butch was a tremendous worker, mm -hmm. tremendous athlete who who did that slow, deliberate style like we talked about earlier, and gave Billy a chance to. And I think Billy was the baby face there, which put him. Yes. Uh, he'd always been the bad guy, put him in a bad position. It just it didn't materialize. Yeah, I do. I remember that uh, there was something going on up at the office with Jim, and they found out that he had been doing something with some paperwork or uh, the files or something. It was something that had to do with that, and, and when he was told that he was going to be terminated, they had to let him go, then he went home and, you know, was going to do, the, I guess, the manly thing to do. Just go ahead and kill yourself. <laughs> but he ended up not killing himself, which was good. Driving down a highway, drinking, drinking, and don't bogart that joint, my friend, buys it over to me. <laughs> yeah, that was a big one, man. It's like, holy Christ, you hear what happened? No, oh, Hacksaw dug in an air and cheek. They got the the cops, got him, put him in jail. For what? Oh, man, they were smoking dope and drinking a beer on the freeway and got caught by the Jersey cops. And, Are you kidding me? Oh, man, they're in jail now. Because this was a really big angle. It was dug in with USA and the Sheik, you know, don't say USA, don't say USA. Yeah. And it was Sheik's kind of, the one time to be without Nikolai and be on his own in a singles match. And it was a big, it was a big angle. It was, the, it was the one that was making Duggan a household name. It was the one that was going to push Duggan to the top. Uh, and then when that happened, boy, oh boy, we had to have a meeting then. <laughs> 
Yeah, of I bet all in a room. And Vince was up there and said, "They will never, never work in a WWF again." And I looked at Jimmy Hart, just like you're sitting here. I went, "They'll be back." <laughs> And they came back, and they should come back. I mean, so what? They get pop for having a little grass on them and a little beers and going to go the town? Hell, who doesn't have a few beers? I got a beer right here. You gonna fire me? Oh, well, I better put this away. <laughs> well, I think it was more the breaking kayfabe that Vince was probably pissed at. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's just how the wrestlers are. I mean, you, gosh, you go into a building, you got 20,000 seat arena, you got 2,000 uh, 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 staff people that's working there. You got you got 500 riggers and and and, and, and people running cables and then they all see us go in the lunchroom and sit down and have lunch together. But you can't ride down the street together and share a joint with somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, I suppose. Let's be realistic. You remember when this was filmed when they did boardroom stuff like that? We probably did it at the office, but maybe not. I don't remember. Okay. Um, there's a lot of memorable pre-tapes like this and stuff. Did you enjoy that aspect of the business doing? Um, yeah, some of the ones, you know, mm -hmm. the ones that involved me. <laughs> right, well. <laughs> Jim Crockett Jr., like so many before him, like Bob Geigel and Jack Tunney, exude unbelievable amounts of charisma on camera. Could they not find somebody See, to you had that you have that innate ability to make people mad. You really you really do. No, you do. No, you do. You, you do. You just haven't watered it enough and I, let it. I haven't had to use it, but I use it here. I get my ass kicked for real. You used it, you made a million dollars. Um No I didn't. Uh, what? <laughs> they didn't pay that much back in those days. Is were these guys behind the scenes what we saw on on camera pretty much? Um, they weren't playing a part. I mean, this was generally... No. The, nobody was playing a part back in those days. It was... And that's why you had so much success, is because you didn't have to be a different person anywhere. When you saw us, we were maybe more gentlemanly because we weren't trying to sell a ticket at that point and sign an autograph. Right, but you weren't acting. When we weren't right. acting. It okay. was just our natural own there in the TV camera. You got to expand on it and become bigger than life. And uh, that was probably the hardest. Well, I, I wasn't successful at it when, I, when Arn and I went to the WWF. They were trying to tell us things to say, and I got in a lot of trouble. Right. I said, "Look, you don't know how to be me. I've been me. I've been creating me for 13 <laughs> years. You do not know how to be me." Would they hand you a script, or, or just like they they weren't that much in? They were pretty much on uh, Saturday night's main event. Right. More so than the other ones, but. The other ones, you know, they never asked us to do very many of the promos. But, you know, they liked our work in the ring, but they didn't, you know, putting us in front of the camera very often, okay. interview-wise, it didn't, didn't happen very much. But, but it was, uh, you know, that, that was, we were good at what we did, mm -hmm. you know, and all you had to do was say, you guys got four minutes and talk about uh, Baltimore tonight. Right. Did they eventually in WWFE under, come to understand that about you no. and Arn? No. Okay. <laughs> what did you think of her when she first came in? Whose idea? This is like confession. No, it's not. It's professional confession. It's wrestling's nah. confession. Nah. Um, now it was, it was um, trying to fix. Uh, 
not trying to fix anything. They were trying to recreate Baby Doll. A, a fitting choice? Well, it, it wasn't successful. Right. Why? Just didn't chemistry. Mesh. Chemistry wasn't there. Gotcha. Whose idea is this? Um, don't remember. Wasn't mine. Right. I mean, I didn't know her. Mm hmm. Um, you hear tons of stories about the wild 80s and the horseman's antics behind the scenes. Did the girls party with the guys at all? Did they go out? Were they able to be like one of the guys kind of thing? One of the boys? Or was it a, a separate world for the ladies that we saw involved? Valets or? Um, the valets that I had, Dark Journey and, and Baby Doll, kind of did their own thing. They, were, um, they weren't horsewomen. No. It was our job to make them stars again. And we were good at it. Gordy and Roberts leave the company a few months later. Um, and I don't know why. Don't, right. No. Um, or don't remember. Is Michael Hayes as effective without? Um, you know, you said you could put anyone with the nucleus of the, of the horse. Right. Could you, could you put anyone with Michael and have free birds? I, I don't, I don't, not everybody had the flexibility that we had. Not flexibility, the adaptability. Okay. Is, would be a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, Ole really didn't have the adaptability. Ole had to work Ole style. You know, and I know that Flair and Arn and myself and Barry, I mean, we could, we could wrestle rock and roll and road warriors. Right. Two different styles and still right. Okay. And still make it happen. And, you know, and, that, and that's not a criticism of other people because other people are, were major superstars in this business doing it their way. Right. You know, and so it's not a, not a, not a criticism, but you, you know, whether it all worked or didn't work at that time, you know, I, I think that, that you, you kind of needed the whole package of the Freebirds to be the Freebirds. Well, I mean, I've been punched and stabbed and had sprayed with mace and You know, but as you said at dinner, that was the art of really making people mad. Right. And it's a twisted compliment <laughs> to have someone <laughs> spray you with mace because you're so good at your job. <laughs> How many industries can you say that about? Really? But at you, the time, you, you I mean, you, at the time, are you aware of that or are you just. Well, it just comes with the territory. Right. I mean, if you're a heel, you're trying to make people mad so that you can sell tickets and make baby faces look good. And uh, so it, it comes with the territory. Right. Um, today, I'm told, in the very publicly traded company of WWE, you can't touch a fan no matter where they are, in the ring, on top of you, on your back. You have to just allow security to do it for fear of stuff like this, lawsuits. What guidance were you given by promoters at the time for protecting yourself in a territory? Well, were you ever told you do what you got to do? No. 
Okay. No, you couldn't. If if a, if a fan jumped in the ring, right, he was fair game. You know, I mean, it, it was uh, Terry Funk told me one time. He said, "If you ever get in a fight, you have to win. Period. That you don't have a choice." Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and then there was ways to protect yourself going to and from the ring because it's not like now with big barricades and big all this kind of stuff. I mean, you had a little stinking little rope right. and you're still walking arms length away. And, uh, you know, and it, it was, uh, it was some pretty, the more heat you got, the more crazy well, stuff happened. The more of a risk it was to go yeah. to work every day. Sure. Yeah. It was in Houston, Texas. One time I was, I went to the matches um, in full disguise and sat in the, in the balcony in the, uh, in the Coliseum, in the Sam Houston Coliseum, and Gino was wrestling Mil Mascadas mm -hmm. in the last match, and I knew what my spot was where I hit the ring, and I got a friggin' wig on and a baseball cap and I'm sitting there watching the matches, and, and actually it was really kind of boring to watch all the matches. <laughs> but when I, when I popped out of the bleachers and hit that ring, and he and I beat up Mascaris, he and I went straight out the back door of the Coliseum and never turned around to look, and the people were all coming after us. Talk to me first of all about this myth that we often hear, or reality, about Butch Reed having no show to show, which allowed you to kind of get Butch, into Butch no showed had been AWOL for, t this was like on his second or third day. He didn't show up the night before to the matches, or uh, this was like the second day or something. He didn't show up the next day, so he was gone like three days. But it was Butch Reed who was scheduled in the match with Steamboat. Steamboat had said he was taking off. He wanted time off, and Vince is like, yeah, you know, you gotta have to drop the belt, so they're gonna go with Butch, uh, which would have been a good choice. Mm -hmm. You know, he would have been probably the first black intercontinental champion. Uh, they had not put a, 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 any kind of a championship belt on any black person at that time. Uh, he would have been a good choice. He was a good interviewer and a good worker. He would have done good. He had slick as a manager, but he went AWOL. And uh, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and walked by. And, Hogan says, what about this guy? And he looks at me and says, well, yeah. And that's how it is. Your discussion with Steamboat beforehand, um, before the match, was he, uh, he, I guess, was okay with this? I think he wanted the time off, right? To be yeah, he kid. wanted time off. He, he, he had won the belt, now he wants time. He won the belt in March, now it's June. Uh, so we got April, May, <laughs> what, eight weeks, now he wants time off. I won the belt. But Vince, I want you to know, before I win it, I'm only want time off. Well, he wouldn't have won the belt, so. Right. Uh, he thought he was probably in a good position in a, in, in a, in a, in a spot to, to get this time off, but that's not the thing to do. If you are the champion, if you need time off, he, he should have said, Vince, I'm, I'm going to have to drop the strap. I'm going to kiss my, me and my wife, and she wants me home, and I don't know what to do. Right. But he wanted time off. I don't know if he wanted to take the belt with him while he was off or what. I mean, how long are you going to be off? One day, two days, three days? I mean, a month, six months? But anyway, it was a, it was a situation where I was put in, and uh, uh, he had no problems going out and doing the thing with me. We put it together, and uh, Pat helped us, gave us, told us what he, what we, how, how to do it, and we put it together and did it, and it worked, and it was fine. Uh, he has since said that he didn't like losing to an Elvis impersonator, and, I never knew I impersonated Elvis, but uh, uh, you don't get to pick and choose what impersonator you lose to. I mean, Jake impersonated a snake handler. You know, <laughs> Piper, Piper's Canadian. He impersonated a damn guy that 
Where's where's the guys of guys Scotland? Scotland. Hell, he wasn't from Scotland, for Christ's sakes. Hogan impersonated a, a muscle of Venice Beach, California. Hell, he the only time he went to Venice Beach is when he was working for the WWF. He'd never been there before that. Hell, he's from Florida. I worked with him a long time. Mm -hmm. Probably longer than just about anybody worked with him. And I bet he liked working with you. Because you made he people kept look right, very he good. Kept, he kept writing my name down. Right. <laughs> well, 12,837 people, so it's well, tough not to write the name down. <laughs> um, you went over here, even if, you know, only by count out, but uh, while we're on the subject, um, it's often said that, you know, the line between, you know, the church and state, booker and talent, you know, do you, do you work on top of the card while you're a booker? for fear of maybe getting criticism. What's your feeling on that? Should a booker be in a prominent role in the company or should they step aside, book for the company, and then come back if there's a change in the book? 12,000, how many people? <laughs> the end justifies the means. You know, if you're the booker and not drawing and still, still winning mm -hmm. and your ego takes over, you know. But if you're putting a whole bunch of people in the seats, Great. You guys made so much money. You had such a great feud. What was the chemistry with you and, and Dusty? Why did that work more than maybe a, a, you and Kendall Wyndham? <laughs> you look like you want to laugh. <laughs> I am laughing. <laughs> Dusty was already an icon. So you work with an icon or you work with somebody that is wanting to be an icon. There wouldn't have been 12,000 people pay to watch me and Kendall Wyndham wrestle. But uh, it, so it's just the stature that Dusty was at as opposed to any kind of personal chemistry. Oh, I mean, there was personal chemistry because because it sold. I mean, it sold for the TV title. It sold for the U.S. Championship. It sold for uh, bunkhouse matches. It, it sold for barbed wire matches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, whenever, and, and I was very, very fortunate that he and I had that kind of chemistry that the company, that was one of the foundational stones that that company was, was turned around with. Mm -hmm. I was a great gimmick. Had made, made him a arch enemy with everybody in the locker room. You know, here we are b b battling our ass off, and four of us in a car and trying to find a place to sleep. And he's got a Hilton hotel, and uh, he's got a first class ticket. And he's got a limousine. He's got some black kid named Virgil toting his bags, and uh, he's out there throwing away fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars, and hundred dollar bills every night. And we're going hell. You know, it could be our money. You know, we're not. Our paydays are going down. He's throwing money away, so. It put Ted in a, in, a, in a pretty bad spot as far as the locker room goes because Ted had always been, uh, he was always, from what I understood, it's the first time I was around him was when he came there, but from the old Mid-South days with him and Duggan and Butch Reed and, uh, and Harley Race and uh, Coco and Jake and all those guys, he was very well respected as a stand-up guy and a, a good technical wrestler, and now he's doing this Million Dollar Man thing. Mm. Uh, it put him in a bad spot. He handled it okay as best he could. He, he never really came around and told anybody, look, fellas, I have to sign for this money every night. Vince is not just giving me money to go throw away. And hmm. So he had to sign for the money that was thrown away. That's some commitment that they made to that. Uh, yeah, they really did. I mean, that was a strong, strong commitment to to go that far. We talked earlier about buying fresh-cut flowers. The fresh-cut <laughs> flowers were... A pimple on somebody's ass compared to a guy throwing away twelve, fifteen hundred bucks every night. That's true. And flying the first class tickets were two thousand uh, uh, back then, at least a thousand one way or two thousand and 
and, and have some hire somebody just to tote your bags and give him mm -hmm. a couple hundred grand. Hell, he don't even have to get in the ring. Sure. So it was a lot of heat there. I mean, a lot of guys didn't like it. Mm. Do you remember the first time you laid eyes on? Yeah, I, I think the first time that I saw him, we were in. Uh, uh, what's the town where? What's the California town where there's Disneyland? Anaheim. Anaheim. We were at Anaheim at the convention center there. He was sitting there and having his health food, and I saw him, and he was had, didn't have the paint on and everything. Big body, muscle up guy, and uh, that's just how he started. This is Dingo Warrior, and he got into a, he was put right into a program, I think. He had a few enhancement matches, but went right into a program with uh, Hercules, mm. where they just pounded each other for night after night after night. It was like unbearable. Because Herc, you know, Herc was as big as him and strong, and Herc was a great wrestler and knew how to work, and now he's out there with this guy and they just had to beat the hell out of each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See that event on TV when? Um, yeah, I did. I was in. In TV. fact, I, t I taped it. I had it on videotape, uh, VHS. If you guys remember that, I sure did. Uh, I was in Calgary at the time. I had not come into the uh, WWF, and uh, uh, I saw it, and I've replayed it. I did replay it over and over again, and I watched it in slow motion, stop action, and. I just I knew I knew David Schultz and I I had traveled with him so many years on the road I knew I could tell in his eye I knew exactly when he said what he said to the guy that he was gonna hit him I knew it was gonna happen but to see Mr. Fuji standing down the hallway watching made me think well how did Fuji know something was gonna happen why was he standing there watching it. You got to, you guys, if you can ever go find this tape anywhere, go back and watch. You'll see Fuji in the background down the hallway of the garden. <laughs> and he's standing there with that smile on his face. <laughs> so, see, something, I never talked to David about it or anybody else about it, but I just, I, I just know that there was more to it than them just saying, David, uh, go out and do an interview with this guy. Something was prodded along back there, you know, and. Go out there and hit this guy. I'll hit him. I don't know you want. You won't hit him. Yeah, I am. I win all you want. I got 50 bucks says you won't hit him. I'll hit the motherfucker. Well, if so, anyone in the locker room at the time would have been the one to do it, it probably would have been Schultz, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was a, that was another big, big deal, too, that, that thing that happened. Uh, that made national headlines around the world. And, and it, like you said, for them to go ahead and settle after this. Now, this event happened prior to the Sheik Duggan thing, so... Uh, they didn't need any more publicity. The best thing to do is sell. Mm -hmm. I, I'm surprised they had an insurance policy to cover it. To cover something like that, yeah. Um, July 3rd, David San Martino returns with bleach blonde hair and a new physique. He was gone by the end of the year. Uh, terrible, terrible. Do you like being out there that long? Or is, are you indifferent to the length of the match? Well, I mean, 60 minutes is a lot harder than 30 minutes. Yes. What do you have to do to make it work? Well, is I mean, there a pacing? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't that? know that we. I mean, there probably is, but I don't know that we consciously thought about pacing. The thing that you have to do is your flow. Yeah. I mean, the the wrestling part, the selling part, the come back, coming back part all that has to be a different place because any match you start at point A but you finish at point B and how you get there whether it's 60 minutes or 30 minutes or 20 minutes has a flow to it. And this back then I'm imagining is not something that was discussed prior no. to the match it was something that you and Ricky and Robert and, and Arn could feel. Yeah, well, I mean, it's something that Arn and I may have talked about. Because you're calling the match, right? Yeah, we're in charge. Uh, and, and the thing, well, the thing about it is, 
you, the, the confidence that Robert and Ricky and Dusty and Wahoo and, and uh, every other baby face that we wrestled, they knew that we would never abuse them or eat them up. So they would do whatever we tell them. Never had done anything like that before, so right. I mean it was open anticipation. David Allen Coe, music, concerts, uh, was it too much of a sideshow carnival type thing for you? you no, I don't think no? so. Okay. I mean it was, I mean a lot of places that we went were hugely successful and the matches got just as much reaction as they always did. You know, and they just got more for their, more bang for their buck. You know, I mean, there were some of the places that we didn't draw outstanding numbers at. I mean, Pittsburgh or one of those places. But I mean, we still did. I want to say we still did fifteen thousand people or something in Pittsburgh. Although fifteen thousand people at the baseball stadium didn't look like a big well, crowd. Well, I was going to ask you about working outdoors. <laughs> what are the major differences, other than weather, something obvious like that? What are the major differences working outdoors versus indoors? Is there a uh, well? You you don't you don't have the the reverberation uh, from the fan from the fans. Cheering. Okay. You know, because it's it is outside and it just yeah goes away. You know, but but I mean, there were a number of great spots that we've had uh, huge uh, fan reaction to. Um, you know that it didn't make any difference inside or out. Right. But you just you don't have that that deafening roar that you get when you're in an enclosed building that sure. 18,000 people erupt. idea it was or not mind you I had met David in, 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 in Puerto Rico a few years before that and I had matches with him there when I was in Puerto Rico and he was down there working as Bruno San Martino Jr. Ah uh, yes. Which is you know there again never go I, I say this but there's only been a few people named Junior who have come out of the shadows of their father. Dory Funk Jr., of course, but his father had passed away when Dory ended up getting his big, big push and making a name for himself. But anytime you go, I remember Eddie Gilbert. We mentioned him earlier about uh, something to do. I think Eddie Gilbert, he, he, he was with Missy Hyatt. They were mm -hmm. Eddie Gilbert started out in the business. It's Eddie Gilbert Jr. He, he since he had to drop the, the junior thing. And, uh, for David to show up with blonde hair, thin down, he looked great physically, but he just, it just was not him. Yeah. It just wasn't him. You might have been a star football player, but can you wrestle? Wahoo McDaniels was a star football player, but he could perform. If you can't perform, I don't care what you were right. in another life doesn't have anything to do with the football necessarily. Right? Exactly. Right. You know, and, and I think that that, that was probably a uh, thought process at that time. About you know, Ron specifically, though, were you impressed by Ron? Ron was a tremendous athlete, you know, and uh, I know that I don't think we, we worked with them much no. or if any. So, you know, other than hi and how are you and, right. you know, that and, uh, you know, everything was fine. How would you describe Mr. Dillon's conditioning and athleticism at this point? 
it was different than when he was wrestling all the time. You mean spending all this time with the fours when he wasn't training with you guys daily at the gym? We missed him at the gym. <laughs> Very good. You guys look like you were having a blast, by the way, at ringside while JJ was in the ring. you have any recollection of having a very good time? <laughs> I don't remember that match. I probably blocked that match out. <laughs> well, that's what YouTube is for, my friend. Oh. Uh, what did you think of it? How did it go? Is it something you enjoyed? It's something I survived. Right. A lot of injuries came out of uh, War Games matches. Um, My neck is probably still hurt because of that. Do you oh prefer a more God. straightforward? No, I mean, it was, I mean, we had lots of gimmick matches. Right. You know, I mean, you just had to make the match be what it was, and it was good gosh. I mean, the, the, the people screamed and hollered for... 30 minutes before the match even started, you know. And Who comes up with it? Is it a Dusty uh, thing? I mean, it, it was somebody. Well, I mean, there's <laughs> I don't be a, know who came up with it. It was a very different concept, so there's got to be a point where it's first presented to you that, hey, listen, next month we're going to be doing a War Games match, and you must go, a what? And then... It's got to be presented to you in some way. Yeah, but I mean, we didn't get a vote. This is no, no, I know. This, I mean, this is what we're going to do, and uh, so you know, I mean, it. We talked about it and hyped it and sold out the Omni and Crockett came back to the dressing room when it was over with and said, "God, that was great. We're going to do that in, next month." And I just, I just <laughs> rolled my eyes up at him like. Um. Is this kind of match, because it's not just a gimmick match, it's so stylized, is this something that you got to have some discussion with the other team about beforehand? No. Really? So it's not different from that aspect? No, just the order of things, I mean, people coming, coming in. Coming in. It's, it's simple. I mean, it's really, I mean, it, it is you, every two minutes you had, when you had two heels on one baby face, then you the got the heat. Come back, get three on two, heat, three on three, come back. Well, it's right. simple. Okay. You just, just you just had to deal with with e egos. Meaning people didn't want to do the job or, or people no. wanted to be first, people wanted to No. When when you when you're in the ring beating people up, people are screaming for you. If you're standing on the on the field, watching all your fans cheer for everybody else uh, for 20 minutes, okay. So there had to be a pecking order to who was going to be in the ring. It really wasn't a pecking going. order, but but there was a, there was an order of people that went in for various <laughs> reasons. Why they were chosen to go at what time. And I have to if, go back and watch all these matches with this newfound knowledge now. It's going to be a whole different aspect. Having Hawk come in fourth, that was dangerous. Did you have much interaction with Eddie Gilbert? Not much. I mean, I, I got along. I didn't. We didn't have any issues that, that I know of, um, but it was, you know, I mean, it, anybody that came in the territory at that time, you know, there was, there was a tremendous pecking order already established. And, you know, and I didn't, I don't think that I, I watered it or utilized it in the dressing room in any way. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, mm -hmm. sub, sub, subconsciously. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly didn't try to use it over anybody. It was, see, we, we, there was a lot of mentality when I first got to there in 84. Business was down a lot. But 
there was a lot of appreciation when a place was sold out and the people in the main event. Other guys in the dressing room would thank the guys for the house. Right. Because they were going to make a lot more money. Sure. And, you know, I, I thanked guys when they drew the house and I got paid for it. And there were a lot of guys thank us and when we drew the house and they got paid for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, it wasn't, uh, and that's just the nature of where we were at the time and with the company. Baby Blue. That's it. Tell them. In case anyone who hasn't seen the other DVD we did together. I told Don, I saw Don this year. I told him that and he went, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> I, I never boy, thought oh about boy. that. I wish I'd talked to them before they did it. <laughs> <laughs> they put those baby blues on Valentine once, too. And, bye bye, Dino, Greg. Dino Bravo. Dino Bravo and the baby blue. Once, I mean, Dino's wasn't quite as baby blue as the ones Valentine and, and, and Don had. But yeah, they give turned on. And, uh, you know, Don was never a baby. Don was always a good heel and a good talker. And, big guy for him to go out and have to crawl and sell and beg like Hogan it just wasn't him. Mm -hmm. I go into buildings now into arenas and do these independent shows and have to rest some young kid and I tell him don't worry about being nervous I know you are because I was with Harley and I was with Bruno, and I was with the Crusher who had a big name, and all those people that I had to wrestle who had these, you know, even with Ken Patera, because here's people that, when I was a kid, a young, not really a small child, but when I started to look at getting into the wrestling business, these were the guys that were on top. Mm -hmm. And now here's my chance to go into the ring with them, and I want to make sure I did everything right. Yeah. So the first time I was in with Bruno, I was just nervous. I was just, I mean, really nervous. And he was fine. He was perfect. And second time, it was better. The third time, we had it all ironed out. It was great. You couldn't enjoy doing barbed wire matches, right? Or was it just... Just a different gimmick. You right. just had to be careful. Talk to me about blading for a minute. It's, it's, it's again, something that your average human being doesn't ever have to encounter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And I know you're old school, so I, I will, I will be gin, I will be ginger. How it is? You don't have to be ginger. Just do it any way you want to. Rip the bandaid off, right? <laughs> right way and a wrong way to do this. Yes. Okay. How do guys like you have pretty good skin condition, and then you know I might be sitting here with Abdullah and say something completely different? Your muscles grow in a certain direction. So you should be cutting with in the direction of the growth of the muscle, which is horizontal. Does the does the um, the the depth of the cut uh, factor in, or probably <coughs> a little bit? Right. Is it something you always did for yourself, or did you ever entrust anyone else to? Never. Never had somebody else do. Where did you keep your gig? I'm not going to tell you. Tice. I'll bring up a match and tell you in five seconds on YouTube. Okay. I dare you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, that comes down to how good the camera work was, right? <laughs> um, I hear and it I've goes, talked to it, people it who it keep goes, a gig. It goes to how good you are. Right. I've heard people keep it in their mouth. Is that not the most goddamn insane thing you've ever heard in your life? No. Let's put a razor blade in your mouth. There's other places you can put it. What other places you can put right. it? Right. It just seems like a, an enormous chance to take to, to put it in your mouth. I'm glad you didn't do that. I'm glad you put it in your wrist tape. <laughs> and then disposed of it in your tights. <laughs> Which alone is, let's talk about the circumcision <laughs> risk 
that goes along with that. Um, no, let's talk about this. Yes, sir. Okay. Because this is a different, a different era. Today. Or, or we're talking about this. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the commitment level of the performers to perform at a level that would entertain the wrestling fan to that level for them to, to cut themselves. Absolutely, 100%. And uh, that is the commitment and the passion that many of us had about entertaining the fans to that level. And I have asked a number of people in some of my speaking engagements, I said, I will be more than happy to dig 10 bucks out of my wallet or 12 bucks and hand you the $12 and hand you a razor blade and have you cut your face so I can be entertained. Right, no takers, clearly. Clearly. Yeah. But um, that's, mm -hmm. that's, what it wa that's what it was. And um, so I've, I've gone, my thoughts on that and talking about it have gone from point A to point B in a long chain of, of thought process on that. But it is very, very, um, you know, nobody would put that kind of passion into a job to where they would maim themselves. Well, honestly, it's one of the hardest, I mean, we've been joking a little bit here, but it's one of the hardest things, I think, for people to believe who maybe are not, who don't know wrestling as well, who maybe just have that kind of cursory knowledge of wrestling, like, oh, yeah, they all know what they're doing. And then you tell them they're taking a razor blade and they're cutting their head. And people are taken aback by that. Or their arm. The, or, or their, or their yeah, stomach. Yeah, sure, wh wherever. But, um, or their ear. Or their ear. Ear hurts. Arm hurts. Stomach hurts. Right. Head doesn't? Head hurts. Yeah. Everything hurts. Cut yourself a razor blade for crazy. <laughs> um, how are you not, uh, how can you see after that? Isn't it, isn't it running into your eyes constantly? Yeah, sometimes. Right. So you got your eyes closed for much of the match, or you're squinting no, through you're it? No, squinting, or just sweat. I mean, you sweat in your eyes, too. So, right. I mean, it's just moving. Right. What'd you think of the skit? Too, too hokey for the horseman? Or can you do comedy, uh... too? Ah... I think, I think at that point, we could probably do just about anything. Right, and still be over. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, you just, you had to do different stuff to get other people involved. And in all fairness, it's JJ that takes the bump in the water. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. But this is, once again. And uh, JJ was very good at that kind of stuff. Right. This is once again Ron Garvin in drag. Uh, earlier in the year, he comes out of the uh, out of the crowd, uh, right, being dressed uh, as a woman, uh, and then here he's pressed. And now, is this a rib that he tagged with Terry Garvin at one time? No, I don't think so. Okay. This is just Ron being okay with dressing up like a woman. I don't know. Okay. I I didn't go that. I didn't think it was a that deep type deal. <laughs> it probably wasn't. It's me trying to create something that doesn't exist. You should have been a politician. One of our, one of our big um, one of the radio stations was a, was a big a sponsor for the sponsor oh. in there, and we did a baby doll thing, where the 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 female on air talent came and was in either Dusty's corner or Magnum's corner, or I think it was Magnum's corner, you know, and and had a big promotion and a, and we called them on the 
and did a, a, a spots. Or I think we did spots in the in the dressing room for the next show or something. I, I so the dating game, there could have been something like that. Yeah, it could have been something off coming the, it, in. Well, it could have been off that same station. Okay. You know, I mean it. Because that was Philly, also. You. Yeah. Said. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I guess this is a good a good enough time as any as we're talking about the dating game in the ring to talk about the um, the, the rat scene in 1987. Um, the uh, was it madness? I mean, was it like rock star type? I mean, it, you'd have to ask uh, Robert and Ricky, Ricky, right, and Magnum. And well, Rick, I mean, I'm sure you had a front row seat to Rick's exploits. Yeah, but I mean, it, it was. There's a different kind of fan that wants to hang out with the heels. Mm, interesting. So, you know, it's. It is. Uh, we've we've seen some different stuff that didn't have necessarily anything to do with females <laughs> or males, just different stuff. Okay, so so maybe maybe uh, the, the freakier side of life would visit the Heels hotels. Well, yeah, but you got to understand that not necessarily the Heels hotels. I mean, when you're an independent contractor, it wasn't a team going to a hotel. It was you stayed where you wanted. Oh, you had true. you were all over town. Not you know the guys didn't all stay at the same one, mm -hmm. you know, and and we stayed in Horseman style hotels. Right. What was the move? Was it were, were they would were, were they would they uh, would they go to meet you at the bars? Would would they would they be waiting at the in the arena uh, by the exits? What was if one was so inclined as a virile young man to partake in the pleasures of the women that were offered to you? Where would I be shopping? It just depends on how bold you were. Well, could you? Well, you hear about like Kiss and Gene Simmons had a, a, a the code, you know, row, row, row. You tell one of the roadies, row four, seat seven, and they would be plucked and brought to the locker room. Like, could, could you turn to Gary Juster and say, you know, no, the big boobs in row seven, and he would then bring them back to no. the horseman? No, 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 no. Okay. Did you like the Gary Juster reference in 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 the context of getting rads for the horse? <laughs> I thought you'd at least be able to appreciate it and have a laugh. <laughs> Thank the writer for that one over there. Uh, um, okay, the most luck with women. Uh, I'm guessing it's a Ric Flair or Ricky Morton. Or maybe I'd be surprised. Maybe, tell me, was it Bugsy McGraw? I don't know. I was only concerned about me. <laughs> I was very selfish in that topic. He got a reputation over the years of a guy who was very full of himself, and he, he got ribbed over it a, a little bit. Was he well liked at this time? Um, you know, I, I mean, I hate to use the same thing. I mean, I, I liked everybody. Did you, you know, get along with everybody in the company? Most everybody. Okay. You know, I mean, there were a few people that I didn't get along with, but that was not my doing you know I didn't do anything bad to anybody you know um, and, and the only time as I said earlier that I self-promoted was when I had that meeting with Dusty that one time you know I wasn't trying to get over anybody I wanted to go to the ring and perform and period mm -hmm. and get compensated for it what did you think of Terry as a wrestler um, Terry was a, was a good talent. Um, it was, I, I, you know, and, and I know the situation that he was put in when he came to the WWF when we were up there and, you know, it'd been hard to be. The rooster. Uh, yeah. Poultry in the ring. Yeah. You know, but it was also hard and Arn and I bowed up against it to be, uh, the brain busters with a brain and <laughs> which probably shortened our careers up there you know, listen, or shortened my career for sure up there. It was a wrestling move, the brain buster. 
the, the chicken, the the rooster wasn't. So I mean that was yeah, a, a but, different level. Yeah, of but but we bo we bowed and went to a. What was the rooster thing all about? What's your take? I don't on have. A clue. I had Terry here. I talked to Terry about it. He said all I know is you're still talking about it, which you know he's right. He's right. But, or um, dusty or dusty and the with stinking the dots. with the dots. Right. And dark journey, or his, dark or was it dark journey or no, somebody else? No, it was else? sapphire. It was it was dark journey in just one way. I mean, it was dark journey plus like two hundred pounds. I mean, she, it was a, a like a very strange pairing for Dusty. But the level of commitment Dusty gave to it is, I think, what sold it. So I guess there's the lesson: commit the, the polka dot. Yeah, the the polka dot, the 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 round black lady with him. You know, it, you, Dusty got it over. I knew Kevin when I, the first territory I ever went to, him and Mike Graham were partners. Yes. And so I knew Kevin way before he became the Prince of Darkness and all that kind of stuff and uh, always, always liked him and got along with him and I traveled with him and Mike some. Kevin would go on to book later on and... Oh, he, he, was in, he was part of the office then, I think. He was a student of, of Eddie Graham's. And having worked for Eddie yourself, were you able to see a thoroughfare of Eddie's influence in Kevin? Not like that. Okay. That, that was, when you're the booker, you do, I mean, I never saw Eddie as a booker. I saw Betty as, uh, Eddie as a ring uh, psychologist. Okay. So, you know, whenever, whenever you got people influencing Dusty at that time. You know, you could see different, different things. And, but when all that happened, it was, we were getting close to um, the sale. We were getting close to Arn and I leaving. We were getting close to a lot of different things. So there were a lot of people's fuses in 88. Yeah, it was a case where I, I was, we had had a few t test run matches, Savage and I, and the the fans were, they really, really hated me. I mean, they hated me. Even though he had been one of the most hated bad guys at, at, at that point in time when he was against Steamboat, uh, they, they were cheering tremendously for him. And it's, so... I don't know whose idea it was to come up with a match between Savage and I on the Saturday Night Main Event out of Hershey, Pennsylvania, but the way it transpired was I, I started that match as the heel and I ended it as the heel. And then, uh, of course, you know, he got the guitar, Liz gets pushed down, she goes and gets Hogan, brings him out, and then the Mega Powers was, were born. And he was, with really no big investment in any kind of a two or three months angle, any kind of vignettes or any of this hard money that you have to do to, 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 to start to change someone, it's the same as Jake and I was in the snake pit. Mm -hmm. Jake was a bad guy, I was a bad guy. I walked out and Jake started low rating me, people started cheering for Jake. So Jake was switched just that quick and Savage was switched just that mm -hmm. quick with no big hoopla about it. And I was switched over a period, see they did invest some time in me, over a period of a couple of three weeks with Jesse doing the vote of confidence yeah, thing. Sure. So they did spend a little bit of hard money as far as TV time building something to, to switch me mm -hmm. as opposed to these other two guys. There was nothing really invested in me whacking them. Right. Did you have any issues dropping to Nikita? Were you ever the type of performer that, that had issues dropping it to a certain person? No. Business was business. Was Nikita ready yet? For, for a title, 
oh, that, that didn't, they, they were ready if we told them they were ready. But do you think he's someone who's been underrated over time? I mean, Pilto always, always talk about how green he was and limited in the beginning, but he drew. Yeah. I mean, it, it was you, selling tickets supersedes a lot of greenness, <laughs> and you have to deal with it. And he had the, he was very, very believable, and he was very intense, and um, and it was uh, the the Russian gimmick thing worked. You know, an interesting thing to note. I mean, here. he changed his name yes, to Koloff. Did. Yes, he did. So, um, an interesting thing, though, you talked about the, your decision to to make the uniqueness of the TV title um, by doing that thing where if you could beat me in the allotted TV time, but if not, I won. Um, now that's now that's gone. So, did you, in essence? by elevating the TV title so high, make it almost an impossible task for anyone who followed you to make it a meaningful belt. Because became... You could probably tell that better than I because could. Because it became such a thing, you know, the, the time limit and the, and now it's gone. And it's, what is the TV title at that point after it's been? You agree with me, but you don't want to say it because you're a nice guy. No, I mean, it, I mean, you're more of a historian than I am, okay? And history either proves things or it doesn't. <laughs> That's so good. Okay. You're the politician. <laughs> You're the no. politician. No, I'm wow. Not. History proves things or it doesn't, Nikita. <laughs> you know, so I mean it was, uh, again, but you, but you go back to Babyface champion versus heel champion. True, true. Which I think is the foundation all the time. Right, because you couldn't have him have a chicken shit thing exactly. and, and you, screw you, somebody you, you out you can't, I can't make you look great and still walk out with the belt. Excellent. Very good. And not everybody had that ability. Same night with split crews, except some people work both. You're one of them. you got to fly from the one to the other. Um, in Philly, Flair pins Ronnie Garvin. Um, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson beat you and Arn. Uh, then you're immediately flown to Baltimore to make the second show. You go on later. The main event match doesn't go on until 1130 so that you can make it. But then you do a Road Warriors and, uh, uh, and Dusty against you, uh, Anderson, uh, Arn, and Flair. Um, do you remember this insane night? It wasn't the only time we ever did that, so I mean, it's... Oh. Okay, but still, still kind of crazy, right? We, 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 yeah. Um, Paycheck was bigger. Well, absolutely, but so many things dependent on uh, things being on time and on schedule. You're flying a private jet, I would imagine, yeah. right? So you don't have to worry about delays, but like you could be delayed at the airport on the tarmac, couldn't you? I mean, there are things that could go wrong. Sure. Quite a risk. Did anything ever? No. Oh, he's got there. I mean, we didn't we didn't do that a whole bunch of times, mm -hmm. but you know, like we would always double shot on Sundays, two in the afternoon and eight o'clock at night. But uh, this was two night shows. Oh yeah, and we had done that before. Uh, driving and it was hard. Oh, I drove from uh, Lumberton. No, not Lumberton. North Carolina. Yeah, it's over by Lumberton. It starts with an L, and I can't think of what the name is. Uh, and I was the main event down there, and I was on third, and jumped in the car and drove to Charlotte to run in on Dusty's match. Do you even get out of your gear? Or you just throw sweats over your, your yeah, tights? I think, just... I think it was just sweats. I don't think I wrestled. I think I just ran in on a match. So. But on something like this, I mean, you keep your wrestling boots on, throw sweats on, and run into the plane? We might have. 
Um, what were Crockett's jets like? Were they, were they? Well, we had one jet. It was one. And then we had a Gulf Stream that was a turboprop that was bigger and slower, but the jet was seat 10 people. And Was Dallas a good market for you guys, fan-wise? Probably not, because Fritz was still running. Right. Um, the, this move is credited with beginning the demise of the company by many of the workers. Is that accurate? Because of the Probably. expenses that you're incurring now. Well, you know, I mean, the they came up with whatever and wanted to move to Dallas and they expected everybody to, to jump on the plane and move to Dallas and Rick and Arn and I stayed in Charlotte. Right. Is anyone running things back in Charlotte while well, there was There is... was nothing to run. I mean, so they the, closed the, op the office the, completely. The office was still going. Oh, it was. Yeah, I mean, it's just whoever writes checks or whatever. I don't, I don't, I think all that was moved to Dallas too. But, uh, you know, you, you get out of your bailiwick. I did the video, we did, uh, I shot my, my part of the car scene in the video for Power Driver was we did a construction site in San Francisco. We had the show the night before in San Francisco. And Coco had spent all day doing that Power Driver thing on this, on this, <laughs> one of the kids there and they had a plexiglass thing. And, they let some people in early so they'd be in the audience to film this thing. Then we did that show that night. The next day we were on a set of construction site down the street from the Cow Palace. And I did my parts of that. And then I left and did the video part with me driving down the streets. And the, the, we finished that and I went to the Ventura County Fair, wrestled that night. About three or four days later, we were back on the East Coast, and I had to go up to Connecticut, close to the office, some little bar out, out of Stanford somewhere, and we did the rest of the video where I'm singing and the girls are falling down. And, <laughs> the power driver video was very difficult to shoot it's, it, itself. It, had, it was very... It, it, if you look at it, it was real. It was it's put together, it was cut and edited really good, but it was hard to do. We did the car scene where I pull up and Morocco throws the plank down and the dust flies. We did it about five times. I was just covered in mm. dust. Then I had to leave straight from doing that scene. Once they said, okay, that's good, I left and had to go do the rest of the other video that afternoon and then go wrestle that night. Well, you recorded the song, uh, I guess, that year at some point? Uh, yeah, the song time. was done in... Uh, Honky Tonk Man, I think it was called, right? Yeah, uh, the song was done. Uh, uh, they laid down the, the, the sound, the, the music tracks, and I was in Toronto, and they rented the studio in Toronto, and we, we cut the song. It took about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. I laid the voice. You're down. kidding me. 30 minutes. Done. Yeah. Who wrote it? Was it Jimmy? Jimmy Hart wrote it. Oh, okay. Jimmy Hart wrote it. Rick Derringer did the music on it and Cindy Lauper's old boyfriend uh, was the uh, producer. David of Wolf. David Wolf, yeah. yeah. Took about 30 minutes. The Mega Powers were born, it was proposed simply because there was a, a, a difference in opinion between myself and Vince and what the finish should be in that match with myself and Savage and mm -hmm. consequently, uh, you know, I, I decided that I couldn't go along with the plan they had for me and uh, uh, 
So we went another direction in the finish, which consequently put the mega powers together, which then had Savage later on turn on Hogan. No, no, Savage won the, the world title shortly after that. Yes. And the Million Dollar Man, who was promised the world's title, ended up being the Million Dollar title and never got the world's title. Gave him a secondary belt, yeah. which he probably wasn't happy about. Probably not. October. I, I'd like to hear Ted's thoughts on that. I'll talk to you know. <laughs> I have a feeling I know what they'll be. Well, he should pray for me. Oh, that's right. He's not on That's man. right. He should say, I forgive that man. First of all, why do you think the decision was made to take the belt off of Flair? Is it just so that he could have a win upon winning it back at Starcade? Not a clue. What was your personal reaction when you heard that Ron Garvin was going to win the title? I don't know that I had a personal reaction. What's your reaction now if I told you Ron Garvin was going to beat Ric Flair for the title in 1987, <laughs> a month before Starcade? <laughs> Two months. <laughs> Maybe that's the reaction. Um, you know, I mean, there, there were a lot of things that you just kind of... <laughs> but we were making, we were doing so well, you, you just went through it. But, you know, some of those, some of those towns, Detroit and Pittsburgh and stuff, were towns that we were trying to rev up, you know, and so you do something like that, maybe, and, and I'm speculating, because I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Crockett and Dusty were thinking when they made those decisions, and Flair was involved. Ronnie's title reign pretty <clears throat> much gets derided by everyone for being a contributing factor to to houses going down and, and business starting to tank. Is that fair? Um, you know, the, I, I don't know how fair that is because, again, you get, you, you've now gone against the mold because now you've got a babyface champion mm -hmm. that the people were selling out to watch him wrestle Flair for the title. Now you got Flair coming back for the belt And eventually, they know Flair's going to get the belt back. And that's not something that you're overly wanting to spend your, back in those days, 12 bucks or 15 bucks to go see. Right. You know, but we want to see Flair get embarrassed. Right. So. Most of the guys that come through Minneapolis knew Nick. I had been around him a few times, but not very much. When he came in to be an agent, he took his agent job a little. Nick, he took it a little bit too far. You know, I mean, I'm doing these interviews, Nick, and don't tell me how to do them. Come on, Nick. But uh, Nick and I had a couple of disagreements, but he was fine. He ended up then being the head pecker checker, which meant he had to stand in this test. Yeah. Oh. He had to stand in the shower room and watch us. He knows more about the, the thing on the wall than Missy does. I think Nick, if you get Nick, Nick should be the one doing the, no, Nick, I'm, I'm just playing around. I love Nick to death. He's a, he's the greatest guy. He, he took that with a grain of salt and he, he, he did it, you know. Members of the Horsemen would tag in all different combinations. Was it now evident that like you and Arn were the guys? Yeah. Because always before in the Horsemen, the, the, you had, I was the other single mm -hmm. with Flair, and then you had Arn and Ole. Right. And then you kind of had Arn and Luger, and then you had me with Luger sometime. You know, I, I, that was kind of a mishmash period. But now, this is the start to getting Barry as, as part of the horseman, okay? And um, 
so it, it is now it's just kind of the start that Luger was better as a single than in a tag and mm. whatever you know at least you could you could do that so now you've got me and Arn zeroed in right as the tag team we're the world champions you know so I mean it wasn't too much longer when until Barry switched and you and Arn are considered one of the best tag teams ever. What what is it about the the a good team and working well together and 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 becoming seen as a, a perfect tag unit? What does it take? Well, I mean, you've got to have people that are on the same page. You got to have people that have the right philosophy of what you're trying to accomplish when you go to the ring. You've got to have people that know that your job is to make the other guys look as absolutely good as they can be. So that if you get beat by them, you got beat by Superman. Or if you eke out a win, you eked out a win over Superman. Mm -hmm. You know, and walk back with the belts or whatever the case might be. And... Arn and I complement each other because Gino Hernandez and I were a, a good tag team, but he and I were basically the same guy. Okay? Arn and I were not. Right. And that is probably the dynamic that a lot of other teams miss because they're all trying to be the same. Does that make sense? It does. Um, the Rock and Roll Express appear to be running out of steam here. We're hearing boos in buildings for them. And conversely... I never heard boos for them. But no? No. Maybe in Philly? Well, I don't know. Nah, not too much. No? But conversely here, the, the horsemen are, are white hot now, okay? And it's to the point where... Heels are getting some cheers. Um, you, you're marketable as heels now. There's the Horseman T-shirts, which we see right around here, that Crockett comes out, which you probably made a ton of dough on the royalties Absolutely. for. Absolutely. And yeah. the, the fan club, too. Right. And all the videos that they started putting out. I heard Crockett took care of everybody really well with all that stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, talk about that phenomenon. You, you guys are spent your whole lives trying to be the most hated guys in the business, and now, like, it's... It, it, you, you're becoming cool. Well, it was cool to dislike us. Let me let me tell you what happened in May of 2016 okay. in Detroit. Okay. Second time in 25 years that Rick, Arn, Barry, and myself are at an autograph show. We're at a Comic Con. Okay. Which is not our world right I was kind of amazed anyway <laughs> the number of people that came up with their kids right and the person was not a wrestling fan that was taking the money where I was sitting and wrestling and the, the fans came up and said I just want you to know I love to hate you and this guy was, was floored by that. I mean, it wasn't just one or two, but I mean, for two days, there, there might have been 50 people that had the same quote. And I don't know what they said to everybody else in line, but that was their quote to me. Right. So there wasn't anybody out there being chic and with it cheering for me. What was your impression of Sting upon first seeing him? I mean, we got face paint, a little Road Warrior esque, maybe. I don't know if they were bothered by it or not. You would. I don't know if that. they were either. I mean, they he came in and was getting over. Yes. And the Road Warriors were already over, and we needed more people over. Right. And uh, I know separate locker room, but any interactions with him behind the scenes that would indicate whether he was. 
No. I mean, Someone that would be. I think the only match that I had with him was the one that we were just that we were talking about, was him and Nikita, in '87. Mm -hmm. uh, was it '87? '88. It was '88. This is '87. But the match that we had with him and Nikita at that one thing in '88. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was our first pay per view. And in Baltimore, we tore the house down mm -hmm. for 20 minutes. And uh, he jumped over the top rope, and Arn and I got flattened on the floor. And is he easy to work with? Everybody's easy to work with if they listen to you. <laughs> He's got such a great way of putting, putting himself over, by, and it just. No, I no, but but doing it uh, artfully. Tell me about going into New York. Is is there great excitement? Is there uh, is this a significant event? We were for staying the at the Hemsley Hemsley, Hemsley Palace. Oh, well, it's not bad. That's what you cared about, right? I learned that. Room service is grossly overpaid. Absolutely. And Thanksgiving Day in Chicago was much nicer. How was the uh, How was the New York crowd for you guys? Um, they were about like they were when we started in Philly, so we know it would have been a long haul. Good house, though. We were almost twelve thousand people. Yeah. Um, McMahon, try anything screwy here? I know in the past he called the Athletic Commission for a Pro Wrestling USA card at the Meadowlands and got a wrestler taken off the show. I think it was Crusher Blackwell? Very Yeah. Um, no chicanery of I, that I nature? Don't know. Okay. Was that a risk going to Chicago as opposed to well, I the mean, Atlanta crowd? I mean, the, well, I mean, you're, the people in Atlanta could still buy the pay-per-view. The arena in Chicago was sold out. Right. But did you want the, the hometown fans as loud as they were to be? No. Chicago was, was stinking off the chart. Okay. I mean, when, when we went to Chicago, it was... Limousines and Division Street and the Snuggery and it was happening. Okay. Um, and the Bismarck Hotel and. Did you remember a, a reaction, a locker room reaction, when it was announced that the WWF was going to run their Survivor Series the same night? No, I don't, probably, I, I probably didn't even know. We actually, ours was an afternoon show. What was what was your what was the locker room opinion of the WWF and their workers at the <coughs> simply another place to go another option was there enmity because they were competition no I mean they were always competition you always had different territories and you always had someplace else to go You know, I've been in battle royals and things like that, and, and this was a, really a different concept. And uh, it, it was a great way to, to expose n newer guys that you're going to push to bring them out as far as put them in a team and then have them go further in that team. Mm -hmm. It was a good way for guys that you were not going to start promoting, that you were finished promoting to get them out of the picture. Right. In that particular match, and I thought it, I thought that worked very well. Now, the one that really surprised me the most that I was in had to be the Royal Rumble, where like it was like every back then every three minutes, somebody the whistle blew and somebody came in. Uh, that was a different concept.
Well, yeah. they, they obviously cheated. <laughs> it, was um, just, it was just instant replay before instant replay became popular. Should, should they have won the belts that night in their hometown of Chicago? No. Was it, was it right to piss the fans off in Chicago? Absolutely. Like <laughs> Would you have dropped to the Warriors if that's what Dusty said? Absolutely. Happened? It was a good thing to get Luger the boost as a baby face. And Luger a better baby face than heel, you'd yeah. say? Because we could guide him that way. Um, do you guys given any say in these kind of things? Who, you want, who, who comes to the horsemen? Who, do they go to you for your opinion? Does Dusty say um, what do you think about Most of the time, I mean, if it was something big deal enough, I mean, we would have probably not been part of the decision, but they would have asked our opinion. Jim Ross was very talented. Not was, still is. Still is. And, uh, you know. Shivani feel threatened by this at all with Ross coming in? As don't know. I don't think, uh, Shivani was outstanding. Always has been, always will be. You know, Shivani got in that same level as Gordon Soley. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think Jim Ross is too. What made Ross so great? I mean, you often hear him called like one of the greatest announcers of all time. Was it the, uh, the ability to always call it like a legitimate competition? What, what is it? Sure, about I think that's part of it. I think that's part of understanding what you're, what you're talking about and getting it put over to the fans and what they need, need to be done. And it was, you know, there, there's, those guys were all very good. Do you have a, fa a personal favorite announcer that you watched over the years? Is it a Gordon Soley? Is it a Oh, Gordon Soley Bob was, Caudill. I mean, I loved Gordon Soley. And, and Tony Giovanni was just outstanding. And, uh, you know, so both those guys were just great. No, huh? No <laughs> recollection. <laughs> I'm going to find you pictures of this and I'm going to email them to you. <laughs> so I can't ask you if you were happy about winning the uh, Bunkhouse uh, Stampede. Um, I probably got paid the same as if I'd have been the first one out. out. I was going to say, what'd you do with your $25,000 prize? <laughs> um, how would you sum up the year 1987 for Tully Blanchard? Um, 87, I, I would probably say, is probably the apex of the tidal wave of the horsemen. Um, it carried on into to 88, but then when Arn and I left in September, business dropped. Um, I wasn't happy that it dropped, but I wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking about how the Brain Busters were going to become <laughs> with world your, champions. With and, your new logo. <laughs> and. Uh, Etc. So, you know, but it was just, it was just, uh, it, it was sad to a degree when it all came to an end because it didn't have to. Mm. What could he have done? Oh, he could have done a number of things different, but I mean, just not, you know, I mean, I mean, it was great to be able to have a stinking jet, but Airplane tickets are cheaper than having a jet and pilots. And so there's shared blame for the demise of Jim Crockett promotions. Oh, it's not I, just one person. Oh, or, I don't think so. I, I don't, you know. Um, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, they, they, the unfortunate thing, in my opinion, they were not a, capable of identifying 
the talent that was the foundation of their success. Mm. And they were rewarding a bunch of people that were stars, but weren't the, sound, the foundation. And at some point, the foundation, if not taken care of, quits. Right. Well, I thank you for not quitting for the last three hours. <laughs> for allowing us... Has it been three hours? It has. For allowing us to hate you. <sighs> loving hating you. Thank you again. And thank you for watching. Another great piece of work. That, uh, another Jimmy Hart idea. Uh, Jimmy was always coming up with great ideas when he, whoever he was managing, it was, wasn't just me, if he saw the, 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 the ball start to fall a little bit as far as his talent was up here on top and now mm -hmm. things are not looking so good because we need a boost, well, he came up with the Peggy Sue angle where he dressed up like Peggy Sue. We had a girl dressed like Peggy Sue with Sherry Martell. Then when Sherry Martell wasn't around, Jimmy Hart dressed like Peggy Sue. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy uh, hang, let me hang from the rafters, put a cage up. I know put a cage up and let me up there in the cage and then he will drop the gimmick down to me or whatever. And, uh, and, and he was always coming up with ways, very innovative, mm -hmm. to keep whoever he was managing in that spotlight mm -hmm. because the managers were paid according to where your wrestler was on the card. Right. So if he managed a guy that was a first and second match, and if the guy on the first and second match was making 600 or 300, Jimmy was making 150. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if Jimmy's managing a guy that's making 3,000, then Jimmy might be making 15, 1,800 yeah. for that match. Yeah. So he was always, he was innovative and that was good. Mm. Well, I will tell you, Hawk. 1987, it's, it's really a, a very, very pivotal year uh, for the company. WrestleMania 3 was the, the biggest event, and really, I think, the height. The height of the WWF in the 80s. They talk about the 80s era and the boom period for Hogan. That was it, putting almost 100,000 people in there, and then the Hogan turn, and then you started a, an extremely long... I don't know, what's the record for the IC title? Is it, is it uh, still you? Four, yeah, 464 okay. days yeah. or something. It was a huge year, it really was. And uh, I it, it, was a, it, was, it was a historical year. It's one that people can look back on and say, would it, would it ever be that way again? That is what turned wrestling around. Mm -hmm. That particular year put us into mainstream media, put us in big buildings. Had We had people wanting us now to come to their show. They wanted us to come to be part of their events as opposed to us saying we're in professional wrestling and people turn their nose up and go, oh, you really do that? So it changed the attitudes. It changed the whole generation. Yeah. And I can think of no one better to have taken us there than I appreciate you. it. Thank and you. I appreciate 1987, it. hell of a year. It was all a haze. <laughs>